Very good. Okay. So welcome everybody. Thanks, uh, Tim, for joining us. Uh, Tim, I have known at least twenty-five years. Tim, can you? Something like that. Yes. <laughs> I don't know exactly how long. And he's been extremely active, quite prolific, I would say, in all matters of theoretical physics related to standard model and beyond standard model. And on a personal note, Tim, I would mention here in front of everybody, we had our own Duke Atlas little workshop, uh, I think a couple of decades ago, and you very kindly showed up. And most of us, you know, were looking at papers here, looking at papers there, but your presentation and then the few days you spent with us, I think were extremely useful. So <laughs> I really enjoyed that meeting, I have to say. Yeah, very good. Maybe it's time for you to come back to our next one or yeah. something. <laughs> So a little more formally, Tim uh, has been at UCI for some time. He's a fellow of APS, many other awards I see, uh, including Tim, you are now the UCI Chancellor's Fellow Professor. So uh, uh, with that, let's, uh, let's uh, over to you, Tim. Let's hear from you on that matter. Okay, uh, let me just share my screen very quickly. And make it full screen. Okay, so it's a it's a great pleasure to be speaking to you uh, this morning for me anyway. <laughs> it's eight o'clock in California, um, and so I was asked to talk about dark matter theory and observation, uh, and so um, that's that's what I'm going to focus on. I probably have a little bit more material than I have time for, so um, I'll try to go a little bit quickly through some of the parts um, that that maybe more people are more familiar with. Um, in case you're wondering, this is the mascot of UC Irvine. It's an anteater. And if you were wondering how it is you end up with a university mascot that is an anteater, the answer is you start your university in the 1960s and you let your students vote on what their mascot's going to be. Uh, it's pretty unique, I think, in the uh, university milieu. OK, so let's get to the science. Um, today, I'm going to talk about dark matter. Uh, dark matter, of course, is a substance that we, we think is necessary to describe the universe that we see. Um, it's actually evidence for dark matter is seen at all scales of looking at the universe. So this includes the largest scales we have available, like the cosmic microwave background, where we need to have some kind of non-interacting matter-like component uh, to describe the fluctuations in the pattern of the CMB. Um, it describes the structures of clusters of galaxies and, and the organization of galaxies. They would not uh, be as clumpy as they are without having dark matter uh, present. And of course, it's necessary to describe the dynamics inside individual galaxies like our own from the rotation curves. I don't actually have a plot of that. Um, we can see the effect of gravitational lensing. So there is something there that is bending light uh, and creating um, multiple images of single objects, uh, which is um, you know, not otherwise visible to us. It's only visible through the impact it has on, on other objects. Um, and of course, uh, the brightness curves of supernova are more about dark energy uh, but at this point, they're precise enough that you can see the impact of dark matter, too. Um, so this is the cosmic pie chart, which shows the ordinary matter that we in the standard model are made of. It's this tiny sliver of a few percent. Dark matter is about 20 percent, and uh, dark energy is the remainder. This is a really old plot actually showing you um, the amount of matter versus the amount of um, vacuum energy. Uh, the reason I like this old plot is because this is the plot that actually started me working on, on cosmology and dark matter, or at least the, the, the version before of it. You see three different, very different types of measuring, um, uh, measuring matter and um, energy in the universe coming from the CMB, coming from uh, baryon acoustic oscillations, that's like structure formation, and coming from supernova. And what's sort of remarkable to me is that in this parameter space of a universe that could have had, you know, a lot of vacuum energy or no vacuum energy, you could have had a lot of dark matter, no dark matter, all three of them really agree very well. And so it was the fact that these three very different types of measurements on three different length scales lining up is what convinced me that dark matter was worth working on. Now, I should mention, you never see this plot anymore. And the reason is, is that the precision of it has gotten down to the percent level. So the plots you see are just this tiny, tiny little region in here zoomed in. And that, of course, you know, is great. It tells you something about the precision that we're able to achieve now with these kinds of observations. Um, but the reason I like the old plot is because it loses the majesty or the mystery, or, you know, the wonder of the fact that these three measurements didn't have to all agree on one region of parameter space, and, and yet they do. That's why I show it to you. Um, here is a take on dark matter or the amount of dark matter from uh, XKCD comics. Um, one person says 2% milk is 2% milk fat, but whole milk is not 100% milk fat, it's 3.5%. Uh, 
The other one says, okay, that's weird. What is the rest of it made of? And of course the answer is 27% is dark matter and the remainder is dark energy. So um, as a particle physicist, my job is to explore how dark matter fits into the bigger picture of particle physics. Um, what we know about it is actually very modest. So we know it, it's dark. Um, what that really means is that it doesn't shine brightly in electromagnetic um, radiation. So it, it's electrically neutral, but really electrically neutral. So not even neutral the way a neutron is neutral. A neutron is, of course, electrically neutral, but if you delve inside it, you find that it's made out of quarks. And so neutrons actually do interact rather strongly with electromagnetic um, radiation as a result, just much more weakly than electrons and protons do. Um, so this is far, far more neutral than a neutron is. If it is made of charged particles, they are so tightly bound that uh, energies we have available, you know, even cosmologically, don't actually manage to excite them. It has to be massive, and what that really means is it has to be non-relativistic, because it has to be able to cluster into the galaxies that we see today. So this can still allow it to actually have a very small mass, as long as it's created in a very cold state where it doesn't have much energy, and it has very weak interactions such that it doesn't get sped up. So for example, well, I'll talk about neutrinos in one second. They are not a good candidate because um, they are created, we don't know how they're created actually, but um, they interact strongly enough with the standard model that they would get accelerated and they would not be non-relativistic. And so neutrinos can't form galaxies like the, one, like the ones that we see. It has to be stable, meaning still alive today um, or with a lifetime, at least on the order of the age of the universe itself. So if it is decaying, it has to be just starting to decay at this point. Otherwise, it wouldn't be here for us to see it uh, in influencing um, things with our telescopes. And nothing in the standard model of particle physics fits the description. This uh, is a, a sculpture that used to be in the Tate Modern Museum. The Tate is spelled incorrectly, I'll note, uh, for those of you who want to go see it in London. Um, it's called Cold Dark Matter and Exploded View. It was actually a very nice sculpture, three-dimensional. You could walk around and look at it from different angles. Um, it, it, my take is that given what is can be created by this very limited amount of information about dark matter, I'd like to be able to see what the art world can do if we could actually tell them what kind of particle it is. Um, so dark matter is physics beyond the standard model. Uh, and that's really just by going through all of the elements of the standard model that have been discovered and seeing that nothing has the right properties. So of course the photons, leptons, W bosons, the hadrons, they all shine too brightly in electromagnetic uh, radiation. Neutrinos, um, are neutral, but they are too light. They can't cluster into galaxies. Um, Ws, of course, are charged, but these and, and Higgs bosons are too short-lived. They're neutral and they're massive, but they decay in a fraction of a second, and so they can't be dark matter. So dark matter is a manifestation of physics beyond the standard model. Um, this is a Venn diagram that I made sometime around 2013 when somebody was asking me about relationships of different theories of dark matter. It's not actually totally complete. There are a few things missing from it uh, that I, I've thought of since. Um, I'm not sure if its value is really more as abstract art or as science, but, but the overlaps actually are telling you something about how theories are related. So if someone tells you about minimal supergravity, supersymmetry models, this is actually a subset of the PMSSM, which is a subset of the minimal supersymmetric standard model. You <laughs> think? Um, and these theories encompass a wide range of parameters. Um, the range of masses that are under discussion go all the way from tiny, tiny fractions of a GeV, say 10 to the minus 33 or so, far, far below the mass of any particle we've ever seen that has a non-zero mass, uh, and all the way up, if it's a fundamental particle, to about the Planck scale. And there could even be dark matter which clumps together such that while it's made of individual particles whose masses are less than the Planck scale, it's bound together in something like a black hole or a black hole remnant, um, or even just like a clump of some other kind of particle, um, which might even effectively have a mass that's much bigger. Um, similarly, the interactions with the standard model range all the way from gravitational, as the weakest we can imagine anything interacting, um, all the way up to things that interact far more strongly than the strong nuclear force, though these are only allowed if the mass of the particle is very, very heavy. Um, and there's lots of theoretical activity uh, looking at what dark matter is. Um, this is a plot of a number of papers with different keywords in their title that's made by Sasha Believ. Uh, and uh, I'm proud of this plot because he actually had it for Susie Higgs, top and extra dimensions, and I was the one who said, let's put dark matter. So the questions we want to ask about dark matter in order to put it into a the, you know, Lagrangian that contains a standard model as well, is the very fundamental questions we'd ask about any particle. What's the mass, the fundamental mass that is? What is the spin? Is it absolutely stable? That would tell us something about how it interacts. Um, 
how does it inter interact with other particles that we know about? So we know it interacts gravitationally. That's how we see it. And also, since gravity is the structure of space-time, all things should feel gravity universally. Um, but does it feel the weak interaction? Does it talk to the Higgs boson? Does it couple to quarks and gluons in some way or to leptons? I'll say a little bit more about this idea that it could be a thermal relic. Um, these are all questions that you'd like to have answered. So if you saw dark matter walking down the street, you would hand it at this piece of paper and you'd say, please fill it out for me. Um, so I spent a lot of time in the last few years working on the Snowmass project um, at uh, in the United States. So this is something. This is kind of like a decadal survey of particle physics um, in uh, in the U.S. Um, and so I'm going to take a few things from the report just because it nicely organizes what was known, you know, as of last year when the report went live. Uh, and so um, it, it has a, a lot of nice images that you can see. So this is the same. Plane we saw before, the dark matter mass is ranging along the x-axis. The interaction strength is on the y-axis. So go, this goes all the way down to uh, G Newton as the weakest interaction you can imagine and all the way up to very strongly interacting particles. Um, it, it spans this sort of incredible range of masses. Um, the shading here of red versus blue is telling you basically the region where the dark matter manifests more like a wave. So if the dark matter mass is so small, what happens is the density of particles necessary just to explain the dynamics of our own galaxy is so high that the dark matter manifests itself coherently. And so it doesn't look so much like individual particles that are coming in one by one to your detector. It actually looks like your detector is seeing some kind of wave uh, phenomena traveling through it. And so the red region is showing you where the dark matter is wave-like. In the blue region, the mass is big enough that the local density would have you know, a few particles per, per unit volume. And so then it looks more like a quantum regime where we would see individual particles. Um, and then indicated here are some of the, you know, interesting regions that people have identified theoretically. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about thermal dark matter. In fact, I'll talk a lot about it, Oops, sorry, uh, which is this region up here in the, the rectangle. The classic WIMP or weakly interacting massive particle lives sort of in the upper part of this rectangle. And the QCD axion is a, a very light particle that's introduced to explain the strong CP problem. It actually has a very light mass, and so it lives in the other uh, region of parameter space. Um, and then finally, sterile neutrinos are necessary to explain neutrino masses. Now, that doesn't tell you what their mass should be. It could be anything above about a keV or so. Um, however, if you want it to be dark matter, it can actually be dark matter if its mass is around the keV scale. Uh, and then one last little interesting detail. Um, there's a very nice argument that tells you that the dark matter can be a boson in this entire region of mass space but it can only be a fermion if the mass is uh, bigger than about an EV or so. And the reason basically is just because of Fermi degeneracy. If you look at the smallest galaxies that we've ever observed and you try to pack enough dark matter particles in them to explain the motion of those galaxies, you find that if the dark matter is a fermion whose mass is less than an EV, you can't actually fit enough particles into it. In other words, in order to be that galaxy made out of fermions, the dark matter would actually have to have a larger volume uh, in order to overcome the Faraday degeneracy pressure. Uh, and so fermions are only allowed for heavier dark matter particles. And this is kind of a cartoon, obviously, because this interaction strength is not a totally well-defined um, quantity. It, it represents a lot of different terms that could be in the Lagrangian, but it's actually a very nice way of organizing what we know about dark matter and where we're looking for it. And then this is showing you a summary of the searches that have sort of been done up until today. Um, we've actually made small inroads into a region of the QCD axion space. Um, we've done a lot of searching for the classic WIMP uh, using direct searches. Um, we'll talk about all these things, of course. We're starting now to try to look into uh, lighter thermal dark matter particles. And we have information about sterile neutrinos that come from X-ray observations. So I'm going to spend some time talking about this thermal dark matter region because it, it's a particularly attractive target. And it's also one that I happen to work on um, a lot. So before I get into that, though, I wanted to mention uh, something about the fact that dark matter must be at least quasi-stable. Um, this is actually telling us something important about how it can interact with the standard model. And there are sort of two different strategies one can use to realize this uh, fact about dark matter. Um, one is to invoke a symmetry, um, or at least an approximate symmetry, to prevent the dark matter particles from decaying quickly. And the idea is if there's some new Parity, let's say, for example, a Z2 discrete symmetry, which forces dark matter to couple in pairs, then you can no longer have a decay. So without the parity, you would just write down an interaction of the dark matter with a bunch of standard model particles, and then the dark matter would decay into those standard model particles. 
Um, with the symmetry, I have to put down two dark matter particles in order to conserve the parity. And now if one dark matter comes in, another one has to go out. Of course, I can still get rid of dark matter because I could bend this final state dark matter particle into the initial state and then I can have annihilation. Um, but that's not the same thing as decay. It requires there to be a pair of particles for it to happen. And that actually is enough typically to, uh, to lead to viable models of dark matter. And of course, this parity is just an example. You can explore larger and continuous symmetries as well. Um, if the dark matter is very light, there's another avenue to try to make it stable. It might be that there's no symmetry and so it is decaying, but it decays slowly enough that the lifetime is longer than the age of the universe. And the example of this would be the QCD axion, which has a decay width, which goes proportionally to the mass of the axion cubed divided by its interaction with the standard model, which is called the axion decay constant uh, squared. So basically, and these two parameters are actually um, very highly correlated for a QCD axion, um, but they're independent for a, a more general particle called an ALP or an axion-like particle. So um, for a QCD axion, if this decay constant is bigger than 10 to the 12 GeV, then the mass of the axion is less than a milli electron volt. Uh, and as a result, you put these together and you end up with a width that's small enough that the lifetime that it corresponds to is, is bigger than the age of the universe. And so you get a viable parameter space. So part of the reason why people uh, prefer these kind of regions for axion searches is because these are regions where it can be the dark matter. Otherwise, it would not have uh, survived until now. Um, now, I'm going to focus a little bit on the thermal region of, uh, of dark matter. Um, and this is all about how the dark matter is produced in the early universe. Um, and the most attractive proposal inside that region, um, though not the only region, not, not the only one, is something called a weakly interacting massive particle or a WIMP. Um, WIMPs are popular because they naturally can account for the amount of dark matter we observe in the universe. And they also occur in many models of physics beyond the standard model that are our favorites, like for example, um, supersymmetric extensions. Um, they're also a vision for dark matter for which we can use particle physics experimental techniques to search for them very effectively. And so they are something that we know how to look for. Of course, this raises the question, are we just looking where we know how to look? Are we looking into the lamppost? Maybe, but on the other hand, you know, if you lose your keys in the darkness, the first place is you look under the lamppost and then you try to figure out how to look out, you know, not under the lamppost if you don't find it there. So we're still in the process of looking under the lamppost as well as starting to kind of eye the territory that is in the shadows and wondering how we can technologically get there. Um, this is another image you can find on the internet. You can probably tell that I like things like that. It turns out you can buy dark matter. It, it, it builds muscle mass. It's a, some kind of nutritional supplement. Uh, so I guess it's good for wimps. Um, it costs about $60 US for 20 servings. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't tell you how many particles are, are in the jar. So you don't know what the fundamental mass is. Uh, and maybe most importantly, it's available in blue raspberry fruit punch and grape flavors. Uh, it's, um, so I think if we, we should agree that if there are three types of dark matter, like there are three types of all the other kinds of matter, we should definitely name them using these labels. Um, I can tell you another thing is that a colleague in Korea bought a jar of this so he could show it at Colloquia. And uh, he said that it tastes absolutely disgusting, though I think he probably could have guessed that given the flavors that are available. Okay, so let's talk about why it is that thermal dark matter is such an attractive picture. Um, and the reason is, is that it gives us a way of understanding how much dark matter there is in the universe today. Of course, it's not required the universe works this way. It's just very... Um, it's just a very nice picture. Everything fits together. It doesn't have a lot of moving pieces. And so we think that it's likely that things work that way. But of course, until we make measurements, we don't actually know. So it's worth understanding the argument. Um, and the argument starts out by imagining that the WIMP, um, uh, since thermal dark matter is usually, um, WIMPs are usually defined, or some people define WIMPs to be just those particles that have a thermal production um, to freeze out. So the picture starts with the WIMP in chemical equilibrium with the standard model plasma at early times. So imagine some little fictitious box in the universe. Um, inside that box, there's a plasma of hot standard model particles if I'm early enough in the universe's history. Um, so, you know, at least photons, electrons, and so forth. But, you know, if it's early enough time, it would be a plasma of quarks and gluons and even Higgs bosons and everything. So if we imagine that there are interactions um, where the dark matter can annihilate to produce standard model particles. And of course, that means that the reverse reaction is also allowed to happen. And if this reaction is fast enough that this process is in equilibrium, then that means that there must be a population of dark matter particles also inside this box. 
And we can even understand the relative number densities because since the reactions that change one type into the other are in equilibrium, these two different plasmas share a common temperature. And so this equilibrium is maintained by the scattering of WIMPs into standard model particles and vice versa. Um, the evolution of the dark matter density, so I'm going to call that N, is controlled by the Bolt by a Boltzmann equation, which tracks the effect of the expansion of the universe. So this is just telling us that the number of dark matter particles dilutes because the universe keeps getting bigger and bigger the more I wait. And also the creation and destruction of dark matter and the collision term. This is normalized by that cross section for annihilation that we talked about, and it multiplies N squared minus N equilibrium squared. So basically, this term would just like me to set the number density of dark matter to its equilibrium value. And if this were the whole story and the universe stayed in equilibrium the whole time, it would be boring. And the reason is, is that we know what the equilibrium number density um, for a non-relativistic particle is. Um, it's given by the Boltzmann distribution. Uh, so it's you know got some terms that go like the number of degrees of freedom and the mass, et cetera. But most importantly, it falls exponentially as the temperature decreases. So the universe expands and its temperature falls, presumably the mass of the dark matter is fixed, um, then the amount of dark matter becomes exponentially suppressed. And this is not at all shocking, right? What this means is that there's a balance going on between dark matter annihilating the standard model and standard model annihilating the dark matter. But if the temperature of the plasma gets to be small enough such that I don't, on the average, have enough um, energy in my standard model particles to produce the dark matter, then that process is going to be very, very rare. Uh, and so... It'll happen sometimes because of the tail of the distribution, but I'll end up with a very small population of dark matter as a result. So if this was the whole story, basically we would just wait until the temperature is very, very tiny, there'd be nothing left and there'd be nothing to talk about. Um, but actually this is not the whole story and that's because the expansion of the universe also eventually results in a loss of the equilibrium condition. And so that basically is what happens when this term for the expansion becomes significant and comparable in size uh, to the collision term. Um, and so, when the expansion term dominates, the scattering that maintains equilibrium can't keep up with expansion. And physically what's happening is the universe is expanded to the point where now inside one interaction length uh, of volume, there's only one dark matter particle. And so it doesn't find anything that it can actually annihilate with. And so it just sits around there and it, 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 can't, it can't get rid of it. The process that was keeping it having a common temperature with the plasma has switched off. So once the loops become sufficiently diluted and they can't find each other and annihilate, basically the amount of dark matter per co-moving volume becomes fixed. And this moment, or which is not a precise moment, of course, it's a, it's a smooth process, but we think about this as a moment sort of where we cross the threshold where there's many dark matter particles in the volume to where there is one, we call that moment freeze out. And obviously when exactly that happens depends on how big the annihilation cross section is because that's uh, the term that we're actually comparing with in the Boltzmann equation. So the basic picture for how dark matter is produced if it's a thermal freeze out relic is we start out with the dark matter in equilibrium with the standard model plasma. So this is a simulation of the Boltzmann equation. It's as a function of temperature. So as the temperature drops, we move um, from the left to the right. That's also time going forward. Uh, this gray curve that becomes dashed down here represents the equilibrium density. So you can see it's falling exponentially, and it's just set to some arbitrary initial condition. So you know the y-axis units are not very um, important. So we follow uh, the equilibrium uh, density as the temperature decreases, and that happens all the way until we get to the point of freeze out. So that's when we depart from the equilibrium curve. And it happens when the number density of dark matter times its uh, cross-section for annihilation is similar in size to the Hubble scale. And we can make estimates for how big we think these are in terms of fundamental parameters, like say a coupling of the theory or the mass of the dark matter. But really it's, it's just these quantities themselves that, that, that matter. Um, you can make an estimate though, and if the dark matter is 100 GeV, this would happen when the mass over the temperature is about 40, or actually when the temperature is about four or five GeV or something like that. So this is actually something that happens at a relatively low temperature compared to the scale of say collider experiments um, in the universe's history. So of course we get to the uh, freeze out point and then at that point we stop following the equilibrium curve and we just uh, become flat for co-moving volume and end up with a certain amount of dark matter. And so of course if we had a different cross section that was um, a smaller cross section, it would take us longer to fall out of equilibrium and we'd end up with more dark matter. And if we had a larger cross section, um, sorry, 
I said that backwards. If we had a larger cross section, we would stay in equilibrium longer because it would take us longer to fall out of equilibrium and we'd end up with less dark matter. And whereas if we had a smaller cross section, we'd fall out of equilibrium earlier and end up with more dark matter. So somewhat paradoxically, the more weakly interacting a thermal particle is, the larger its density in the universe turns out to be today. Uh, and so in some sense, this is also interesting because usually in particle physics, our experiments are of course sensitive to big couplings and insensitive to small couplings, um, since the coupling determines whether something happens or not. But this is actually a case where the output of the physics is inversely related to the coupling. And so in some sense, it argues that your coupling should be bigger than something rather than that it should be smaller than something. Okay, and so for a WIMP, once we know it's mass and cross-section into standard model particles, you can predict the relic density. It's pretty amazing because since it relies on an equilibrium initial condition, it's actually, you know, there, there's essentially nothing about the history of the universe other than the assumption that it was hot at some point, which we're pretty sure is true, uh, and that the dark matter had uh, interactions that kept it in equilibrium at early times, right? So that's the important physics assumption. Those two assumptions basically tell you you can predict the amount of dark matter just knowing its uh, particle physics properties. So ideally, what we would like to do is see dark matter interacting with the standard model. Then we would be able to measure these interactions. You could compute the annihilation cross-section, and then we would do this calculation and see if we get the right amount of dark matter. And of course, if we do get the right amount of dark matter, then we know that we understand the universe all the way back to the time that it grows out. If not, it probably is telling us either that we're missing some of its interactions or that maybe the universe was not actually the same as our assumptions at the time of freeze out. So um, 3GeV is a low energy scale from the point of view of, of colliders that we do on, of, sorry, of experiments we do on the earth. But actually we don't really know the universe at 3GeV at all. We have information about the universe at the time of the CMB, which is about EV energy scales. And we have it um, at the time of big bang nucleosynthesis which is MeV energy scales. So in fact, 3GeV, as far as what the universe itself was doing, is an extrapolation backwards from those times. So in, in some sense, you, you know, it, it, that's also telling you that dark matter is an opportunity to try to learn about the universe at early times. Um, of course, the first step to try to make this program work is to rediscover dark matter by seeing it interact with some force that's not gravitational. And then that would tell us something about what standard model particles it likes to interact with and spin mass, et cetera. So um, the WIMP miracle is a very attractive picture. And I mean, I just sort of presented it to you for that reason. It's the reason why WIMPs are popular, but we should be careful because we don't really know much about the history of the universe. Like I said, you know, we really understand the universe back to the time of nucleosynthesis and MeV. A typical WIMP freezes out, as I said, in a few GeVs, but a much earlier time. And so if we understand the universe between GeV and MeV, everything's fine, our predictions are correct. And so we can predict what the properties of dark matter should be in order for us to get the right amount of it. But you could imagine that in the meantime, after the freeze out happens, there's some other particle of the universe which decays into dark matter that adds more dark matter. And so now we'd end up with more dark matter than we wanted. So that would cause us to go back and adjust the properties of the dark matter such that we ended up with less of it through annihilation, um, such that we got the amount that we see today. Um, or it could be that the dark matter has some primordial asymmetry between particle and antiparticle the same way that protons do. Um, if that's true, then maybe the amount of dark matter uh, being produced through annihilation is different because at some point you run out of all the antiparticles and you're just left with the dark matter particles. That would give you typically more dark matter than you would have expected otherwise. So again, it would throw off your calculations. Um, you could also imagine that some other particles out there which decays just not into dark matter, but into ordinary matter, but that would actually then increase the plasma and dilute the dark matter that we have. Um, so basically there's a lot of uncertainty in this calculation of the relic density. And I would say this is a feature. And that's really because understanding the annihilation cross-section and verifying the WIMP miracle for the dark matter abundance would push back our understanding of the universe to early times. So it's not so much that we can predict what the dark matter should look like based on the amount of it we see today as if we could measure its properties then given the amount of dark matter we have, we would be able to test our understanding of the universe from the MeV scale back to the time of freeze out. I think that's the right way to think about that. Okay, so there are lots of different kinds of dark matter particles and they can be cataloged based on what makes them stable, how they interact with the standard model, how they appear in detectors. Um, there's lots and lots of different theories. I'm actually not gonna talk about 
any of them basically. I'm just going to talk now about how we search for dark matter and um, what that those searches are telling us. So I'm going to talk about four different types of searches for dark matter. Um, the first is indirect detection, where two dark matter particles annihilate the galaxy and produce standard model particles that can be detected, say, by the Fermi Large Area Telescope. This is a picture of that, which looks at gamma rays. And by the way, you might be wondering, if I just told you annihilation stopped at some point, and that's how we got the amount of dark matter we have, why is it the dark matter would be annihilating today? Um, the reason is, is that that freeze out process took place when the universe was very uniform. And since then, everything is clustered together into galaxies, which has produced big over densities of dark matter where annihilation can start to happen again. So in the center of our galaxy, the dark matter may be annihilating because its density has built up to the point where it's allowed to. Um, another process is direct detection, where dark matter around us comes in and interacts with some detector built out of standard model particles. Um, this is an example of the xenon detector, which is uh, based on uh, two-phase um, xenon, mostly liquid xenon. The dark matter comes in, interacts with the xenon, and uh, and that leaves a signal that can be read out. Um, of course, an important way to look for dark matter, like to look for um, any particle you can produce, is at a collider, like the Large Hadron Collider. Energetic standard model particles can come in. If they have enough energy, they can produce the dark matter, and then we can see it. Um, and then finally, there are cosmic probes, which don't actually involve the standard model. So these are somewhat different than the other three types of searches. So this is looking for things like maybe the dark matter interacts with itself. That could leave its imprint in the structure of things like galaxies. Uh, and so looking with telescopes could actually tell us about this uh, possibility too. So let's start with indirect detection of dark matter. Um, indirect, detec indirect detection tries to see the dark matter annihilating. Um, they occasionally find each other in the galaxy or even maybe in other galaxies. They turn into energetic standard model particles, which if they are aimed at the Earth, uh, can be detected by us. And in particular, people focus on photons and neutrinos. And the reason is, is that as the photons and neutrinos travel from wherever they're produced through the galaxy to get to us, um, they are largely undeflected by anything in the galaxy. So they don't lose energy and they don't get bent uh, in terms of their direction. And so as a result, we can actually see where they come from and we can see more or less the energy that they're born with. Um, charged particles are very interesting, um, but they are generally deflected on their way to us by the galactic magnetic field. And so as a result, we don't really know where they come from. Of course, they could still be a signal of dark matter annihilation. It just means we lose one of the handles to talk about. So the rate of production of indirect detection is described by a cross section. That's that same annihilation cross section we saw before. Um, and then the, the, the differential cross-section of the number of events and energy goes like this, uh, this cross-section to produce whatever we're looking for, say a gamma ray, and then an integral along the direction I'm looking of, so the yeah, integral along the line of sight of the telescope um, or detector of the dark matter density squared. And it's squared because of course, to annihilate, we have to have two particles coming together. Um, we have reasonable, idea of how the galaxy works kind of at the scale of about where the sun is. And in other words, we have a pretty much, we have a pretty good idea of how much matter there is in the Milky Way enclosed in a circle that's about, you know, the, the distance of the sun from the center of the galaxy. But we have basically very poor observational um, constraints on what the mass distribution is um, closer to the galactic center. So if you look at different popular models for what the, the distribution of dark matter would be, you can see they all kind of agree roughly where the Earth is. And then as you get into the inner galaxy, you find that they diverge quite a bit. Um, and that's just because you know there are there's not much data constraining them. Uh, if you look at uh, a simulation of how the galaxy formed, like for example, this one that's called Via Lactea 2, this shows you the density squared, um, right? So the bright areas are high density squared, the dark areas are low density squared. And you can see that there is a big overdensity predicted at the galactic center. And you, know, you can see that is true in most of these uh, models that you get somewhat more dark matter at smaller uh, radii than you do uh, where the Earth is. Um, also, you can see that there's a lot of substructures. There's these little hot spots. And what these are are clumps of dark matter inside the galaxy, or maybe even small galaxies that are orbiting the Milky Way. The dwarf uh, spheroidal galaxies, for example, are good candidates for these. Um, or and dark matter subhalos. So exactly where you're looking, you're not sure. Simulations would suggest the galactic center is a good place to look, um, and also uh, that there should be small dark matter dominated galaxies. 
So I'm going to focus a little bit on gamma rays, and that's because, like I said, they point back to where they come from. Um, and they're produced from almost any standard model final state, because basically if you produce quarks, well, quarks hadronize into pi on, pi zeros decay into gamma rays. So you're going to get some photons from it. Um, of course, if you produce electrons, they just radiate the photons directly, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the dark matter, of course, can't couple directly to photons. Um, and so the rates are typically expressed as a convolution into annihilation into some final state f. And then the probability of getting a photon of a given energy fraction over whatever f's energy was um, as a function of that momentum fraction. And of course, these f's are kind of complicated functions. Uh, they're non-perturbative because they involve things like quarks fragmenting into, into pions. So they involve fragmentation functions like, like I measured at colliders. Um, and they also involve things like radiation from final states, um, et cetera. So it's a complicated process. And if we take a look at them, um, they are kind of smeared out. So this is a simulation for a dark matter of mass 1 TeV. So the highest possible energy you could have got is here on the right side of the curve. You can see that quarks, Ws, Vs, tops, bottoms, Higgs, they all look pretty similar to each other. And that's basically because they all go through the same thing of the heavier particles decay, and then there's hadronization, fragmentation, and, uh, and finally decay of pi zeros and stuff like that. The leptons are somewhat different, and so you get a somewhat harder spectrum of photons from electrons, muons, and especially taus, because the taus can decay directly into, into photons. Um, so these simulations are done with a showering Monte Carlo like Pythia, and then they're parameterized into uh, programs like micro omegas or something called PPC4DM. Um, you can also actually get dark, uh, gamma ray lines. Um, these occur when the dark matter produces the photon in a two body final state. Since the dark matter is neutral, this has to be a loop process. And so it's presumably suppressed compared to the other kinds of annihilation. But because it produces a photon of a definite energy, it is something, and the energy is related to the mass of the dark matter annihilating, and then also the other particle that was produced at the same time. Um, it produces sort of monoenergetic um, photons, and this is a feature that conventional astrophysics has great difficulty producing. Uh, and so maybe the fact that the background is uh, more under control can help compensate for the loop level rate. Um, and so that's, that's the kind of searches you see people doing with gamma rays. So indirect searches can access unique properties of the dark matter, such as, for example, the dark matter lifetime. You know, the dark matter lifetime has to be so long that basically it's hopeless to try to do it with a terrestrial experiment. But if you just look at places where there's lots of dark matter in the sky and ask, you know, is it decaying into neutrino plus photon or photon plus photon or E plus E minus, right? Which you do by seeing one of these two particles. You don't typically see both of them um, or BBR even then you can get a series of constraints, right? They, they're discontinuous because different instruments are looking for each one of these final states. And you can see that the, the bounds on the lifetime of the dark matter from these searches are many orders of magnitude times the age of the universe. So they're far more than we need just to explain the fact that the galaxy exists at all. And of course, you can also look for dark matter annihilating. Um, here's a case where it annihilates into bottom quarks and up to the mass of the threshold of the W boson, at which point it annihilates into W bosons. And again, you can see different experiments kind of come together to give you a somewhat uh, complicated set of sensitivity, right? So this is more than one experiment has been put together to, to estimate these. These are all plots that come from the snow mass report. So down at the lower masses, these bounds are coming from the Fermi Large Area Telescope, uh, which is a satellite. And then up around a TV or so, Fermi loses sensitivity. It just can't measure energies accurately at that high energy. Um, but there are ground-based telescopes for gamma rays like HESP um, or in the future CTA, which can actually probe this regime too. And so you can see um, there's sensitivity up here as well. Okay. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about direct detection of dark matter. Um, so let's look at a few basic features of direct detection. Um, the basic strategy is to look for the low energy recoil of a heavy nucleus when dark matter brushes against it, or maybe in some detectors, it could be the recoil of an electron. So the idea is you have some detector, it's made out of some something that, that you think can respond to dark matter interactions. You put shielding around it. So the dark matter comes in and the shielding is there basically because you wanna make sure that this is really dark matter and not a neutron or a muon or something else. 
that might make it uh, to where your detector is. If you're looking for you know nothing in the shielding coming in, then the nuclei starts uh, bouncing around or, or gets pushed or jostled or something because something interacted with it. And then nothing interacts with the shield on the way out as well. So this is sort of like just sitting there and looking for your detector to, to, to start uh, reacting to something that you can't see coming in or going out. Obviously, it's important that you have very heavy shielding and good, uh, you know, to prevent any kind of stray signals from ordinary matter that might be rare from coming in. And in the non-relativistic limit, so in the dark matter around us in, the, in our galaxy, should have a very low velocity. Otherwise, it would have escaped from the gravity of the, the yeah from the gravitational pull of the gravity. Then there are sort of two form factors that survive in the non-relativistic limit. And they can either be a constant, meaning independent of spin, so spin independent scattering, or the interaction term could look like the dot product of the dark matter spin with the nucleon spin. And this is called a spin dependent scattering. And here are some examples of detectors. This is the CDMS, which is made out of germanium. It's, it's a crystalline uh, type of detector. And this is another image of uh, the xenon based uh, detector. This one's LD, actually. So the rate of direct detection depends on one power of the dark matter density, because we just need one dark matter particle to make this reaction happen now. And of course, the density that matters is not the density way off in the middle of the galaxy. It's a density close to Earth, which is better known. So we have the, the cross section, that's the particle physics uh, input. The dark matter density rho divided by its mass is just the number density of, of non-relativistic dark matter particles close to the Earth. And then there's an integral over the velocity distribution of the dark matter. That's not really measured, um, but we can sort of guess what it must look like based on the dynamics of the galaxy. Like I said, the dark matter can't be moving too fast or it would have escaped from the galaxy. And you can use models for how the dark matter, um, how, sorry, how the galaxy formed out of dark matter originally to get some estimates for what the distribution of velocities might look like. And then if you're scattering with nuclei, there's also some nuclear physics that comes in basically uh, because there's a certain momentum transfer involved. And so what the nucleus looks like depends on that momentum transfer. Um, another interesting feature is the fact that this velocity distribution actually is expected to have an annual modulation. And so the way the argument works is that the dark matter itself, of course, overall is at rest with respect to our galaxy, right? The dark matter is most of the mass of the galaxy. So if you ask what is the rest frame of the galaxy, it's going to be the rest frame of all the dark matter in the galaxy. Individual particles are going to have some small uh, velocity. Where by small, I mean like 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 4, which is actually still pretty relativistic by our standards. But uh, it, it's they're like bullets, right? They're not uh, super relativistic particles. Oops. All right. So however, the sun is slowly moving around the center of the galaxy. It doesn't follow a very well-defined orbit. But it takes like about a billion years to kind of go all the way around the galaxy once. And so as a result, uh, this dark matter, which is net at rest, in the rest frame of the sun, it actually looks like a wind of dark matter is coming towards the sun because of the sun's motion itself inside the galaxy frame. Um, so that means that there is actually a, a net direction that we expect the dark matter to have and a typical velocity, which is just characterized by the velocity of the sun itself. Um, of course, the Earth is also um, orbiting around the sun. And for half of the year uh, in June, the Earth's velocity lines up with the sun's velocity in the galactic rest frame. And so as a result, this gets a little bit stronger. Uh, whereas in December, it's going uh, against the sun's velocity. And so this wind looks a little bit weaker. So actually, as you wait for the process throughout a year, you would expect to see more dark matter particles coming in in the summer and then getting weaker in the winter. And then you go back to summer and it'll get stronger again. So this annual modulation is a handle you can use to try to understand signals. Of course, lots of other things on the Earth uh, correlate with the year because the temperatures and so forth do too. So you have to be a little bit careful. Um, but this is still a very interesting thing. And most importantly, you can predict actually where you expect uh, this oscillatory behavior to have its maximum because of the dynamics of the galaxy. Um, so since I mentioned uh, the fact that we're looking at the dark matter around the uh, solar system, here's another XKCD comic about the fact that uh, the density is 0.3 GeV per centimeter cubed, which are units that kind of make my head explode. 
But so what that means is that if you integrate over the volume of the earth, you get basically the mass of about a squirrel. And of course, the person who doesn't understand says, well, which squirrel is it? It's not actually a squirrel. So I have to say, if it were a squirrel, I think it would be the squirrel problem. Okay, so from particle theory, we usually now have dark matter interacts with quarks and gluons. Um, however, in direct detection, the momentum transfer is so tiny because the velocity of the dark matter is so small that it usually doesn't see individual quarks and gluons. In fact, it doesn't even see individual protons and neutrons. It sees the entire nucleus coherently. And the spin and dependent interaction is enhanced by the number of protons or neutrons, or both, depending on which one it interacts with, or both, um, because it basically sees the nucleus as an entire ball of nuclear ch of nucleon charge. And so um, as a result, it just uh, the, the amplitude goes like the number of nucle the number of nucleons, and so the cross section scales like the atomic number squared. Um, the spin dependent interaction doesn't see that kind of coherent interaction because basically inside the nucleus, the spins of the individual nucleons tend to be paired up so they cancel out, and instead what they just see is the net spin of the nucleus. So it's harder to look for spin dependent interactions just because. There's no coherent interaction, no, no coherent enhancement of the rate um, if you're interacting with a nucleus with spin. Um, and of course, connecting the scattering rate with the nucleus to quarks and gluons requires hadronic matrix elements and nuclear form factors, and these are largely taken from experimental results and sometimes from nuclear theory simulations. Um, there's lots and lots of activity. So this is, again, showing the dark matter mass as uh, uh, on the x-axis and the spin independent interaction with nucleons on the y-axis. Uh, you can see that what's currently excluded in, in this tan region, which is largely by the xenon-based experiments, um, goes down to sort of about 10 or maybe a few GeV. It keeps going up to higher and higher masses, though the little limits get weaker and weaker because there's less, less dark matter around us um, uh, as the mass gets bigger. And you can see that compared to 2013 to today, there's actually been an improvement of almost two orders of magnitude. So these experiments have actually made a huge amount of progress. And there are you know, new versions operating, which will go even lower. Uh, and you know, ideas for, for, of course, going even further than that. Um, this gray region is called the neutrino fog. What happens here is, this is there's a background of neutrinos, of course, from the sun and from uh, supernova explosions. At some point, these detectors become sensitive to those neutrinos. We don't know how to screen those neutrinos out, and we don't know how to distinguish them from dark matter very well. So as a result, at some point, you start to see a background of neutrinos. And at that point, these experiments are going to be challenged because they'll no longer be background free. Now, that doesn't mean they can't search for dark matter, of course. It just means that you have to do the analysis more carefully, and you're not going to get uh, such uh, favorable scaling as you make your detector bigger and bigger because you become limited by the fact that you're seeing a rate. Of course, you get to measure the neutrinos, and that's pretty interesting on its own rate, too. Uh, and if you go to lower masses, so that was uh, the scale from sort of GeV up to um, hundreds of uh, TeV. But if you go to lower masses, so around the MeV scale, you can find for different types of dark matter interactions, there are still uh, ways that we get uh, limits on dark matter uh, and there are experiments that people are planning that can go even lower. And these are largely using um, modern materials um, with very low thresholds. Uh, in some cases, things like um, like uh, like Bose-Einstein condensates. The dark matter comes in and disrupts the the condensation, throws you out of that state. Um, there's a lot, a lot of really key and very cute uh, work going on to try to come up with different ideas for detecting dark matter around the MeV scale. Uh, none of them have really come into fruition yet as you know full-scale detectors, but some of them are getting close, particularly based on uh, crystalline uh, technology. So let me say a little bit about dark matter colliders. Um, if the dark matter couples to quarks or gluons, you should also be able to produce it at high energy colliders. Um, of course, these the collider detectors are some of the most impressive uh, instruments built by humanity. They're huge. Um, but they don't have any systems in them that are sensitive to dark matter. The dark matter is too weakly interacting. It just goes through the detector. It doesn't stop. And so it manifests in the dark matter. It manifests in the detector as an imbalance in the energy momentum of the collision. We don't know the initial parton energies along the beam direction, so you can only really measure uh, missing momentum in the transverse directions. And this is like producing neutrinos in the standard model. Uh, so, of course, 
Um, missing transverse energy signals are a big part of the new physics menu and colliders are also an important part of making measurements, precision measurements of things like the top quark, uh, the Higgs boson, and as Ashutosh knows very well, the W boson. Um, they're challenging because of course, to see that there's a momentum missing, you have to measure everything else. Uh, and so that means you have to understand everything else. And of course, colliders aren't really looking for any of the dark matter that's around us. And so if they did discover a new form of missing momentum, it might be that that doesn't have anything to do with dark matter. On the other hand, they have the advantage that they don't require that the particles be around us in any particular abundance. And so if they are there and their masses are low enough that there's enough energy to produce them, the collider will produce them. And so it's just a question of trying to figure out how to get that signal out of the background. So it produces very, very robust limits and could even make a discovery, which would then have to be probably correlated with something else for us to be absolutely sure that it's dark matter. Um, so there's sort of two different uh, basic strategies of, of searches. One is if there are other particles in the theory that are not dark matter, but decaying into it, you can try to produce those particles. Uh, they decay to dark matter, which is missing momentum, and then some visible particles that you can see. This is, uh, looks like a theory like supersymmetry or theories with extra dimensions. You produce the partners because they're more strongly interacting, and then the partners decay into the dark matter and plus visible stuff. Or it may be that the dark matter interacts directly with, uh, with uh, quarks and gluons. There are no partners we can produce. And if that's the case, you just have to produce them directly. Now, if you just produce dark matter and nothing else, there would be nothing to see. But of course, typically these reactions also do have extra radiation, say extra quarks or gluons coming from the initial state. Uh, and so uh, that gives you a handle that you can look for to see that there is actually um, a momentum imbalance in, in this uh, event. So both of these strategies are used actually to good effect at the LHC. And of course, there are important backgrounds that come from uh, producing neutrinos. So for example, like Z bosons decaying to neutrinos. Uh, so do W, so they also produce charged leptons. But if you miss the charged lepton, then there is a, a fake rate from that. And of course, tau is also produce. Uh, um, neutrinos as well. There are also fake backgrounds that come from this measurement, though these seem to be better and better under control as time goes on. Um, of course, uh, the anatomy of a collision is very complicated. The protons come in as color singlets. Uh, energetic partons participate in the hard scattering. These are controlled by the parton distribution function. Um, the proton remnants leave behind hadronic debris. So this appears in the detector as softer uh, background. And then the outgoing hard particles fragment and hadronize into jets. So the result is, is a bit of a mess, but we actually understand each piece of this reasonably well, such that we can uh, actually make predictions. Of course, the partner distribution functions are some of the most important inputs because they tell you what the likelihood of getting a hard particle out of the proton is at a given momentum fraction. And so here are uh, examples of two different choices of energy scale from the MSTW uh, PDFs. Um, notice also the gluons here are divided by tens. The gluons are actually much bigger than, than the quarks, though at high uh, momentum fraction, the valence quarks in the proton, the up and down, are, are very important as well. And putting these together, you can get limits on, for example, dark matter interacting through an axial vector exchange. Um, here's an at atlas uh, plot which shows you a limit in the plane of the mass of the axial vector that's being ex exchanged and the mass of the dark matter. Typically these limits have this kind of wedge shape where as long as you can produce, so if you have enough energy to produce the mediator and the mediator is heavy enough to decay to the dark matter, you have a pretty good chance of seeing um, missing momentum from that reaction. So it's cut off at the mass of the, the mediator when there's not enough energy to produce it in any quantity anymore. And it's sort of cut off around where the dark matter is too heavy for the mediator to decay into it. And you can get similar results from the, both Atlas and CMS. You can translate these into the language of the direct detection searches. This compares, for example, the xenon type search with a collider search. And you can see the colliders actually have an advantage at low masses because you know, they're uh, not limited by the fact that the dark matter around us is slow. You could also just look for the mediator itself directly. You can produce the mediator and watch it decay back into quarks or gluons. Uh, and there are very interesting limits that come from both Atlas and CMS, and also interesting techniques that have extended these down to lower masses uh, that you know originally we thought were sort of impossible, but you know things like data scouting and trigger level analyses have really allowed us to to push this type of search into a new territory, which I think is interesting just for the LHC in general and goes beyond actually the dark matter searches themselves. 
So finally, uh, we can talk about very light mediators. If the dark matter and the mediator are light down around the MEV scale, then uh, it's very hard to see them at the LHC because they just don't produce enough energy anywhere that you can really trigger on. Um, but uh, there are ways to look for them using lower energy but higher intensity beams uh, to try to say produce uh, like a dark photon mediator, which can then decay uh, into dark matter. Um, this is a plane in the mass of the dark matter versus this combination of parameters that tells you basically how the dark matter interacts with the dark photon and how much the dark photon mixes with the ordinary photon. And you can see that uh, there are some interesting targets. These are the, the black lines that show you, shows you where this model would get the right thermal relic abundance and uh, experiments that put constraints on it, including you know, lower energy things like Bell 2. Uh, and then also pr uh, proposals for dedicated experiments like fixed target experiments to try to look for things like LVMX or, or, or M cubed. So then the last thing I wanna say in just a couple of minutes is talking about astronomical probes. Everything so far has been about dark matter interacting with the standard model, but of course dark matter could also have some interaction with itself. Um, and if the dark matter does interact with itself, it allows the particle in the galaxy to exchange energy and momentum with each other. And ultimately what this does is it changes the shape of the galaxies. So this image shows you two simulations. One uses collisionless dark matter or ordinary dark matter, assuming there is no exchange of energy. And the other for self-interacting dark matter where the dark matter can exchange energy by scattering dark matter, dark matter goes to dark matter, dark matter. And if you compare them, if you zoom out enough, they look exactly the same. So the big scale structure of the universe would, would not change if this is the case. But as you zoom into the fine details, you see that the collisionless dark matter has these bigger spikes of dark matter at the centers of the galaxies, whereas the self-interacting dark matter is more puffy and spread out because it's allowed, because the energy exchange has allowed the, the particles to have a more uniform distribution of energy. So fewer of them get stuck in the center gravitationally. Um, and of course, uh, this is, uh, you know, very interesting. It's the kind of thing we'd like to do with future telescopes. It also highlights some of the weak points of the simulation because these simulations are perfect. They don't include a lot of the baryonic physics that goes into forming a galaxy. And they are um, somewhat degenerate with some of these signals. And so we have to understand those to really make use of it. Uh, okay. So, um, and cosmic probes of things like substructures, which is looking for big clumps of dark matter detected by gravitational lensing, place important constraints on some of the heaviest dark matter candidates, and they probe theories that lead to unusual distributions of dark matter structure formation. So this shows you as a function of the dark matter mass, where now the masses are written in terms of the solar mass. So these are much heavier than the fundamental particles we were talking about before. What fraction of dark matter is allowed given the fact that these lensing searches did not actually see any substructures of dark matter um, at these mass scales? So looking to the future, uh, we've talked about these types of searches. We didn't say very much about the QZ axion. Um, we focus more on this region. But looking to the future, we've had this, we are in a situation where we've made interesting inroads into the parameter space of dark matter. And the planned experiments will actually do a lot more. So we'll be able to cover most of the QCD axion space, all of the sterile neutrino viable space, and a lot of the thermal relic space too. Particularly, we'll add uh, more information at low masses. So these next 10 years actually are gonna see a lot of change in our understanding of this parameter space. Of course, we don't hope to rule out parameter space. What we hope is that we'll make a, a discovery. These yellow stars show places where things are not yet ruled out, but the next generation of experiments could plausibly actually discover something. So these would be transformational discoveries. And then just to recap and finish up, uh, particle physics offers many op interesting opportunities to learn about the particle properties of dark matter. Uh, indirect detection tries to observe dark matter annihilating around us. Direct detection tries to see dark matter scattering with detectors on Earth. And collider production tries to produce the dark matter of high energy accelerators. So together, these searches provide complementary information and they give us, uh, you know, they're more together than they are um, individually. Uh, and so with that, thank you. Yeah, great. Thanks so much, Tim, for a very detailed and exciting coverage. The talk is now open for questions. Uh, please go ahead.
Yeah, uh, okay, David, please go ahead. Hello, hi, Pijinda, and hello, Tim. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, early on, I think about slide four or five, you had like a diagram of various different models. I wonder if you could go back to that um, picture. And that's it. Oh. I went past it. Yeah, sorry. Uh, no, no, no. I think I think what I managed to do is lock up my keynote. <laughs> huh. Okay, so let's this one. I think that one. Oh, that's it. Yeah. Um, okay. Only have to look at it quickly. Is there um, is there like a hidden QCD or or um, a dark pion dark quark nugget sector in here somewhere? There is somewhere. So um, there are a few different places oh, where yeah. that would show up. Right. Uh, so the Technibaryons, for example, is like a dark QCD. This is what it used to be called back when Technicolor was a popular theory. Uh, mm -hmm. Self-interacting dark matter is, is also something that comes out of that. And then things like the quark nuggets are also, uh, that's ordinary QCD, but with an extra force that glues them together. Right. Um, there's one thing missing actually um, that I've added to the plot since, but then I forgot to update it during the slide is I've added primordial black holes, which are a very big omission the first time I made it. Sure. So I'm coming at this from a background more in experimental particle physics, but um, so I'm more familiar with visible um, QCD, but it seems that dark QCD makes quite a good candidate for dark matter in that it can be kind of in parallel with visible matter. So it could have account for a similar amount of dark matter and visible matter, it can be the right kind of mass range, it can even be a little bit self-interacting if that's needed. Is it just a fact that it's not under the lamppost but to find it, or are there other problems with it that people don't sort of emphasize it so much? No, it's actually a great candidate. There are no real problems with it, per se. Um, what I would say is, uh, it, it depends on what you assume. So if you assume that there is a connection between sort of this new dark QCD and the standard model, it can be quite visible and it is under the lamppost. And so it's a kind of a very canonical particle, but with interesting properties, like you said. Right. However, that's not required to be the case. It could be that it's a completely disconnected gauge group that has no bridges. You know, So if you think about the standard model, the quarks are kind of the bridges between the strong force and the electroweak force. If there was nothing like the quarks in this analog we're constructing, then you might end up with a theory where you have this great dark QCD, dark matter candidate, but its interaction with us is only gravitational. Right. And so either one of those things could be true and, and you know, we have to be prepared for either one of them, actually. Okay. They ask, please, uh, could you tell, say, what is dark QCD? Is it dark quarks or another SU3? Uh, yeah, so more generically, I say dark QCD, the way we're using it here is something like a, an extra SUN group that is on top of the standard model. So it doesn't even have to be three, but it could be three if you want. Uh, it may or may not have quarks. Actually, it, it could be a viable dark matter candidates, even if it's just dark glue balls. As long as they don't decay fast enough, they could also be dark matter. Or it could have its own quarks, and those quarks could then have dark hadrons, and they could also be the dark matter. So there are actually a whole family of theories here that one could imagine uh, talking okay. about. And they, they have different properties depending on what you assume. Okay, thanks. If I can have a short um, follow-up on that. Um, towards the end of the talk, um, you don't, don't need to go to the slide, but you mentioned self-interacting dark matter, which dark QCD could be a candidate for. Um, but you mentioned that um, there's possibly some observational evidence, but that can get confused with taking proper account of visible matter in the simulations and so on. What, what is the kind of consensus at the moment in terms of whether self-interacting dark matter really helps um, or Yeah, I think um, <laughs> it's something I find a little frustrating because I think that a lot of the community doesn't really uh, approach it very scientifically. Uh, so I'll tell you my viewpoint and then I'll tell you what the consensus is. Right. My viewpoint is that you really can't make any claim that we have evidence for self-interacting dark matter before you understand all of these confounding things in galaxy formation that might mimic it. So I think the evidence for self-interacting dark matter is not very strong at the moment as a result. Yeah. Um, it may just be evidence for badly modeled things in our galaxy formation simulation. Um, that said, the scientific viewpoint is, right, dark matter could be self-interacting. There is baryonic physics. We need to probably do both of these things at the same time and then put limits on them and understand, is there a way to break the degeneracy and can we learn about them individually? And I think there are there is work going on to try to do that. The view of the community is more, oh, it's all galaxy formation, just forget about it. 
But oh. there are a few people, you know, who don't necessarily take that strict view. I mean, I, I should say there are a fairly large number of people who don't take that strict view. But I think overall, if I had to, you know, put a barometer on the whole community, I would say they largely would say, okay, yeah, we don't understand that very well. Let's just forget about it. Okay, so still an open question. It's still an open question, absolutely. Okay, great. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. There is a comment from Claudio. I think he, he's uh, making a suggestion for dark matter, sterile fermionic dark matter in the Fermi ground state. For example, right-handed neutrinos. So probably the question is status of uh, massive sterile neutrinos as dark matter candidates. Oh, uh, absolutely. I mean, sterile neutrinos can be dark matter. Um, you know, they're here, they're a big part of this diagram actually. Um, they could be warm or they could be cold, depending on what their mass is. Uh, and in some cases, there might be interesting Fermi degeneracy pressure issues if you make them light enough. Though usually if they're the neutrinos that are connected, if there are, if there are sterile neutrinos connected with a generation of neutrino mass the way we understand it, they're probably too heavy for that to be relevant. But there could be some other kind of uh, gauge singlet fermion. So effectively like a sterile neutrino, which is not maybe so involved in, in generating masses for our neutrinos, and they could have effects like that, of course. So what kind of sterile neutrino masses are desired then to act as dark matter? If you want to explain the standard model neutrino, oh, sorry, if you want to explain yeah, the other standard model neutrino masses, <laughs> uh, they live sort of here around the KEV regime. If you make them, they can be heavier, but if they're heavier, they decay too fast to be dark matter. And if they're lighter, they're excluded, actually, because we would have seen them uh, decaying into x-rays. Uh -huh. So there's no astrophysical constraint on the mass of the sterile neutrino if it were to be dark matter? No, if it's truly just dark matter, then it's, uh, it, it, yeah, there's no constraint on its mass. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. We have three more questions lined up. Uh, Xavier, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I, I'm afraid I, I missed the, uh, the start of the talk, but um, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, from the astrophysical point of view, all the uh, evidence for dark matter uh, it really rests upon the assumption that we know exactly what gravity is doing in the low acceleration regime. Uh, however, there's been a number of recent um, detections or, or measurements of what, uh, what exactly gravity is doing in the low acceleration regime, which do not line up with standard predictions. Uh, so I'm wondering if, if the um, astrophysical uh, observations generally interpreted as dark matter are really just an evidence for modified gravity, uh, is there any other compelling uh, reason to, to expect dark matter to exist should the uh, astrophysical evidence go away? Well, so yes, I mean, you referred to astrophysical evidence in the low velocity regime. I think what you're talking about is probably, yeah, low acceleration regime. I think what you're talking about is largely the dynamics of galaxies and of galaxy clusters. Is that right? Uh, yeah, well, uh, even um, even the CMB and uh, and the uh, you know structure formation, all, all that, uh, well, the, the CMB and BBN are actually much higher acceleration regimes, right? Because the, the universe is much hotter in those times. The universe is hotter at those times, but the um, uh, the self gravity of the uh, of, of the of, of the um, of the clumps uh, and the hot clumps and the cold clumps and so on is all, I mean it, there you have there's, a, there's no meaningful clumps during the time of the CMB or BBN. Exactly. The that is why you are, at that, time. that is precisely why you are in the low acceleration regime. The the self-gravity effect of dark matter. But, but what I'm saying is gravity itself doesn't matter very much. It's really just for the expansion of the universe overall. So you know clumps are not really important. Oh I, I was thinking of the of the, uh, of the peaks of the acoustic peak peaks and so on. Uh, I think right. that, those are, those are later. Those are related now now to structure formation. I see. So let me maybe back up and talk about your question more generally. Um, it is true that if one looks at the dynamics of galaxies, um, one can actually find solutions uh, to explain the galaxy based on modifying gravitational dynamics, which actually work a little better than dark matter does. 
I don't think it's a very significant thing in the sense that these are kind of messy measurements because obviously to understand the dynamics of an entire galaxy requires measuring all the different components of the galaxy. Um, but but you know the truth is is that Mond actually does better than dark matter in in um, in that particular arena, if modestly. Um, if you wanted to explain things like the bullet cluster, um, like the CMB, like BBM, one would have to keep modifying gravity on more and more length scales. And the reason is, is because these things occur at very different epochs in the universe's history. And so one would have to add more modifications. And you know, nothing stops one from doing that. So I mean, that that is, of course, a possibility. Um, so I mean, my, my question from is that like, point of view, I would say that the dark matter is you know a more economical solution but you know again i think we should always approach these things scientifically yes we have evidence for a variety of phenomena that can be explained by dark matter and some of them can also be explained by modifying gravity uh of course scientifically what we should say is that it is possible that there are both things going on in our universe and so we should actually endeavor to understand which ones fit better and put limits on on both of them I think if I could just add to Xavier's remarks, I mean, he's uh, one of the two or three uh, astrophysicists who is working on these wide binary systems. I think Xavier, you probably heard, you heard of this term? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, that is one domain where if there is a gravitational anomaly, Dark matter would probably not work because that would mean too much dark matter on the galactic scale. So probably something like that kind of an observation we are looking for. So do you have a take on what the current status of wide binary data and interpretation? I don't really. I mean, I'm not an expert and I would defer to people who are like Xavier if that's the case. But like I said, I mean, these are very interesting laboratories and I think that one can argue that there are places where actually dark matter is not the best explanation for individual phenomena. The reason the community focuses more on dark matter is because it seems to be a better explanation for all of the phenomena together, but I don't even think the word best is very fair. I think what it's fair to say is it's a more economical uh, explanation for all the phenomena put together. But so, I mean, I would cheer on the work that actually attempts to understand all of these issues better. Yeah, a related point would be that suppose suppose we did not know any astrophysics, we didn't have any astrophysical data, but we have all this good data from LHC and other colliders. We know the standard model very well. What in the st beyond standard model physics might compel us to say, oh, there has to be a dark matter particle. Astrophysicists, please go look for it. So something would like say G minus two, if it's confirmed the muon G minus two or the kind of work Ashutosh has done W mass anomaly. Uh, would some if, of this... That was really the sense of my comment. I mean, if there were no astrophysical uh, indications which might be interpreted as dark matter, would we still be looking for it? No, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Okay, but in the future, maybe there might come- Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, I, I think um, you actually brought up what I think would be the most compelling thing that would tell us to go out and look for things astrophysically, and that would be if the colliders were to produce a new form of missing momentum. Absolutely. So if you could not explain the missing momentum from the neutrinos, then you'd say, okay, there's some other particle out there, it interacts very weakly with our detectors, and it's not the three that we know already are there. So then you would say, Hopefully that thing is out there in the universe and we can uh, detect it. And maybe we already are, if it's the dark matter. I, I agree. A related point, Tim, I wanted to make was, suppose, suppose it turns out that it is modified gravity and not particulate dark matter in the sense that we currently think it is. That modified gravity ideally should come with its own gauge symmetry so that it fits well in the standard model unification picture, that gauge field will have its own gauge boson. And that is going, that is my dark matter. So dark matter is definitely there, but whether it is a gauge boson for a fifth force, which might be massless, for example, the dark photon might be massless because it's a long rate interaction, which 
is acting like a modified gravity. So uh, are there any thoughts like that, that uh, you know, we, there is dark matter, but we are looking for the kind of dark matter which may not be there, but we have to look for some other kind of experiments to detect this gauge boson. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is something that people are, are spending time thinking about. Um, uh, you know, there's a there's an area of activity where people try to construct self-consistent theories of modified gravity, right? And they've had some successes, actually. And these typically do require new fields of different kinds, some of which might look like a small component of dark matter on top of the modified gravity or... Um, mm -hmm. So, yes. yeah, absolutely. Or uh, differently, it's like a classical condensate, just like the uh, electromagnetic field is a classical field, is a condensate of photons in some sense, or the gravitational field is a condensate of gravitons. Uh, the classical limit of the gauge boson field. It could be, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Anastasia, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. Sorry, my connection is bad. I hope you can hear me. Um, so uh, I wanted to continue this discussion about Mont and uh, dark matter. So I wondered if you have read papers where they try to do uh, the hybrid models with uh, light spherical neutrinos and Mont, so uh, the ones by Bani and Grupa with the simulations. Because to me, this seems that it would be a uh, like not less economical solution in that way. Because if they, well, at least you know, if it's possible to solve the Hubble tension uh, with the like TBC void, and if it's possible to avoid dynamical friction because of the like light spherical neutrinos not doing that. So, do, what do you think about those hybrid models? No, absolutely. I'm, I'm a big fan of the work, and in fact, you know, one of the things I said initially was. I think the right thing to do is to study both dark matter and modified gravity at the same time in order to understand, can we disentangle them, right? Can we put limits? Can we see which one is working? And what you're, the work you're describing is actually the work that does exactly this kind of thing. So this, this is exactly the approach I think is the correct one. And I certainly would agree that it's not less economical. When I say less economical, I mean, an attempt to completely replace dark matter entirely with MOND is less economical because it requires introducing additional changes to the gravitational interaction at different scales, whereas dark matter requires a one particle with one mass. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I, yeah, I, I would definitely not have said that the, the work you're describing is less economical. I think actually what it is, is it's, it's the correct scientific approach is to try to encapsulate both phenomena at the same time. Do you know of any works from the standard cosmology that address the, those hybrid models? Because all the papers that I've seen, they're written by Mont people. And uh, it's kind of sad that no one from the standard cosmology has, uh, you know, at least tried to uh, make an argument for or against the model, right? Yeah, I actually am not aware of work. I think it, there's something where, well, this is why I complain about the field not being very scientific in the way it approaches thing. I think that this is the kind of thing that they should be embracing. You, the work of Justin Khoury on superfluid dark matter, he yeah. was somewhere in this middle domain, dark matter, which behaves mond-like on galactic scales, but is particularly dark matter on CMB scales. That's right. So, I mean, his... his... Theory is really dark matter. It's not Mon directly, but his dark matter has its own internal dynamics, which are very interesting that, that right, cause it to become superfluid in a certain regime. And this actually has the impact of making it look like Mon. And it, it's actually, it's a great theory. I love it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yes, go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, am I audible? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. thank you, uh, Professor Tim, for such an informative talk. My question was regarding the part where you were talking about something called relic density of dark matter. So there in the graph, you the it, it started with a very large density of dark matter at the time of the Big Bang. Is there a particular reasoning for it? Because uh, I was thinking... There, there can be a possibility that it can even start with a low density. Uh, no, that's right. Can... Um, one of the nice things about this approach is that it's actually very insensitive to the initial conditions. You could imagine that maybe you started the plot with almost no dark matter, even no dark matter. 
The thing is, though, that if you have a plasma of standard model particles and they have a large interaction with the dark matter, they will start colliding with each other and they will start naturally producing the dark matter, you know, whether you started out with it or not. So what would happen is, is that if you're in equilibrium, no matter where you start at t equals zero, you'll be driven up to the equilibrium curve very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, does, does that satisfy you? Uh, yeah, yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, so just a sociological question, Tim. Do, do the Mon community and the dark matter community talk to each other? Like, would there be a conference, Mon and dark matter, such a... Um, I mean, I, I think they do, but I think it's, it is regrettable that these two communities are pretty isolated from one another. And so, you know, I, I go to many conferences about dark matter. Um, you know, I, I do meet Mond people at them, but they're always a very small component of the, uh, of the meeting. Yeah. I think one reason is that so every conference I've been to with Mond and, uh, the CDM is that there's just a uh, like fundamental disagreement on what data tells you. And so when you can't agree on like basic assumptions, then it's, I, I don't know, like I think it's very difficult to reconcile. Uh, yeah. Like because uh, like, uh, for one person, like those simulations fail and for another, they don't. And like, how do you, how do you like define all of those terms? And I yeah. think so we yeah. had, had a study in the digital humanities where uh, like there, there's almost uh, no connection. So, sorry, the, there's almost no connection between like uh, publications, like you know, citing each other, or like conferences are very limited, of course. But that, I think that there should be. Like, I don't know. I think someone should be organizing that stuff because I think that there are many problems, like like just coming more and more. So for for lambda CDM, right? Absolutely. Also, the kind of things that uh, do worry about... No, Ashutosh, you go first, please. Go ahead. Oh, no, I think you should finish your topic because I have a very almost trivial physics question, like into a physics. So go ahead, finish this train of thought, and then I'll ask. Yeah, well, what, I was, uh, what concerns me, Tim, is that things like uh, the presence of a critical acceleration scale uh, the below which the rotation curve starts to flatten out. And the fact that this scale is very close to the cosmic acceleration. Uh, the Mon people say that there isn't a natural origin for such a scale in dark matter hypothesis or the Tully Fisher relation, which they are able to explain it. These kind of things are, are, are bothersome uh, something. One would like to see a debate between the two communities. No, that's right. I mean, and you really need them to be speaking to each other and also speaking in a common language before yes. you can really imagine that debate going forward. I, I, uh, I completely agree. It, sh it should be happening. A forthright admission of what are my strong points and what are my weak points and what might be the way forward. Right now, it is often like both sides are telling the other people's weak points and emphasizing no, their strong points. That's right. In fact, the, the way you put it is nice. And I would have to say both communities overall do a very poor job of what you're saying. Both are not very willing to concede the weak points and not willing to accept the strong points of the other. And I, and I really see that on both sides of it, actually. Yeah, yeah. Ashutosh, please go ahead. OK. Thanks, Tim. A uh, lot of good information for me, certainly. I had a very trivial, almost like an intro-physics question. So if dark matter is non-dissipative now, after freeze out, then how does the clumping happen? I mean, I would think then Louisville's theorem is satisfied by the dark matter particles. So I'm not able to then see how you get high density regions at the centers of galaxies unless you're telling me their momentum spread is there very large when the density is large so that they're still conserving phase that's phase. right the momentum spread is very large this is why galaxies are big basically um ah. 
Good. Can you expand on that so I get it once and all for all finally? Well, I mean, not really. I think that, that, that this is what the argument is. Um, so the dark matter is is pro well approximated as being non dissipative. Um, it's just clustering under gravity, um, and so it's uh, you know the the phase space is such that it, as it gets concentrated, the momentum gets large, and so you know there are statements about how big galaxies should be compared to their masses, which are kind of implied by this statement. Okay. I, can you expand on that so I see the connection between those two? I can't make that link yet. <laughs> <laughs> not thinking Maybe. fast enough. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure I know how to do very much more than that. I'm just sorry to say I'm not really an expert. Um, okay. It's too bad. If you had somebody who actually was a, you know an expert on the on dark matter uh, galaxy formation, they they can talk for hours about this. I just sort of know the basics. <laughs> okay. Anyway. But so you can confirm the fact that the high density region in the center of the galaxy is faster moving dark matter particles and they're slow in the outside. Obviously. That's correct, yeah. So in other words, as they fall into the gravitational well, they speed up. Right. It's basic basic uh, undergrad gravity. Okay, okay, got it. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Xavier, uh, are you there? I wanted to connect with something you said in your talk and compare with uh, some remarks by Tim. Are you there, Xavier? Yes, I'm, st I'm still here. Uh, so in, in a few weeks back at the very beginning of your talk, you said that uh, at the center of the galaxy, because the acceleration is higher than critical, you don't expect any Mondian feature. And uh, that in your picture, that would mean that there should not be any dark matter there because uh, that's what you had suggested, if I remember right, yeah? Yeah, I mean, the, the centers of galaxies, I think, are very interesting. And historically, from the point of view of, of, of the dark matter scenario, are also very interesting because originally they were, um, uh, I, mean, I mean, 20 years ago, when, when the first computer simulations, like the ones we're seeing back down there, uh, began to appear, it, it was a prediction of the dark matter scenario that um, that you should have these cuspy dark matter halos so that, that the center of, of the galaxy should be absolutely choked full of uh, dark matter. Mm -hmm. And um, so then people went and looked for them, uh, for, for that. Uh, and also this is a, a high acceleration uh, system or part of a system. No? So uh, essentially the um, the cuspy centers of dark, uh, of dark matter halos are high acceleration systems, uh, which should be full of dark matter. So people went and looked for dark matter there and found nothing. Uh, essentially, uh, what happens is that um, the density of baryons is also very high. So the, um, the, the need for dark matter is, is practically zero. The, if you look at the constraints, that's, that's what, what, what Tim was saying in, in the sense that uh, the center is very ill constrained. Uh, in terms of the uh, astronomic, astronomical, uh, uh, dynamical uh, constraints, so um, there is so, so much. Um, there are so many variants there that, uh, and there are so. And uh, obviously, we have uh, uncertainties on, on on what the total amount of variance is because we don't know exactly what the mass to light ratio is and so on. So, uh, I mean, within the uh, within the uncertainties. Um, it, it, it is uh, the amount of dark matter is consistent with zero as well in the centers of galaxies, um, and this this originally was a was a, was a very strong uh, problem for the dark matter uh, uh, scheme because they uh, they predicted this this cosmic dark matter halos where there should be a lot of dark matter, so then they had to start inventing ways to get rid of the uh, of the dark matter in the centers of of galaxies. And that's uh, that's all this um, what's called the core cosp problem, mm. and um, and essentially it's 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 an issue of uh, trying to invent uh, feedback mechanisms that can turn the energy uh, released through um, through supernovae and so on and uh, AGNs into a way of uh, uh, pushing the dark matter away from the center, the dark matter that uh, originally should be there. Um, and okay, and this, yeah. this these are very uh, these are very fine tuned um, uh, mechanisms that sort of work in a, in a, in a sort of region of um, 
um, in a sort of region of uh, parameter space, but not in all of parameter space. Then there's also this, uh, uh, I mean, what, what's just been commented on the chat and the um, things like self-interacting dark matter that essentially introduce a sort of pressure, an effective pressure for the dark matter that um, that naturally uh, uh, do away with these cusps. Uh, but the, all, all those um, sort of um, schemes within the dark matter itself to get rid of the uh, all the cusps are, are run into trouble with the smallest dark matter halos. Uh, oh. The smallest places where you need dark matter in, in dwarf spheroidals and in ultra faint dwarfs. Now, now they're finding these uh, clumps of only a, a few thousand stars, a few thousand individual stars and the mass to light ratios are the highest anywhere else. So they, should, they, they would be the uh, the most dark matter dominated systems at scales where uh, uh, self-interacting dark matter and um, and think like uh, things like uh, fermionic condensates and so on would imply uh, zero dark matter. No, I mean when, whenever you start in, imply, introducing any sort of pressure term on the dark matter, you introduce a gene length and a sort of limit below which you shouldn't form any dark matter halos. And uh, and now there are reports and uh, direct observations of velocity dispersions in in systems which are so small that uh, that they basically uh, eliminate any such uh, self-interacting dark matter uh, mm -hmm. options. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, Tim, would you have like to say something? Uh... No, no. I think what Xavier said was actually perfect. Um, I <laughs> I'll note that I think the galaxy formation people would not agree that they invented supernova, but I don't think that's what he intended to say anyway. <laughs> His, his answer is perfect. And I mean, I, I put this slide up to help because as he remarked, right, basically it's, we don't know how much dark matter there is in the centers of galaxies. Um, and so that means that you cannot use measurements really to constrain uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. different uh, models very well. It's naively, one would have expected lots of dark matter at the galactic center, not just gravitationally, because the baryons yes. are falling into the dark matter potential. So, yeah, at least, uh, yeah. So, you may have heard that there's an excess of gamma rays at GeV energies from the direction of the galactic center. And there are okay. some people who believe that may be a signal of dark matter annihilation. Of course, it could also be something else. And so that's why I didn't really emphasize it here. But... Uh, well, yeah, on, on that point, it is very interesting that um, people looking for this self annihilation uh, signal point to the things like the galactic center. The problem with the galactic center and it's what you've written there, the business of the ferocious backgrounds, no? Uh, it, it's 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 absolutely full of uh, of baryons and extremely high density of baryons, extremely high yeah. density of normal astrophysical sources that produce gamma rays. So uh, really the smoking gun in that sense would be to find um, a, an annihilation signal in a predicted High dark matter, uh, high dark matter density system, having very low baryons, such as dwarf spheroidals and so on. And in that's right. Of, that's why the dwarf spheroidals are very important. The exactly. searches. And in all of those, uh, where you have comparable densities of dark matter, theoretically expected uh, high densities of dark matter, it is only in the places where you have, where you also find next to that expectation of dark matter. Uh, a very high density of baryons that you find the uh, the gamma ray signals in the places where you find where you have a, a, an inference of dark matter through dynamics but low uh, baryon density you never find any gamma ray signal yeah no, uh, the one thought i had Xavier is that i think we need to look at the kind of work you are doing wide binaries well, if a few more years go by and that signal becomes very, very clear, I, according to you, it's already very clear, then I think we may have some um, uh, rethinking, right? We, we need a clean system where, let's say, dark matter doesn't work or where MON doesn't work, yeah? Mm. I mean, in, in terms of what Tim was saying, I also, I mean, there's no reason why you you couldn't have both, no, and uh, you have to be aware. We have to be aware that a priori there's no way of um. If, if we find a system, I mean, if for example my my white binary uh, measurements um, become standard and uh, and uh, the, the 
level of precision is, is such that it, it can't be argued anymore. Uh, okay, then then you you know that uh, that you you are finding a signal for modified gravity, which cannot be explained through dark matter. Now that doesn't absolutely rule out completely any presence of dark matter anywhere else, no, but only there. So um, yeah, when, when my, my philosophy then is that you no, know, there is dark matter. Dark matter is the gauge boson of modified gravity, the fifth force. That is a meeting ground where both sides could start to agree, in my opinion. Because when we say modified gravity, uh, it has to be a it has to be a new force. So it has, to, I you know it, uh, it. There has to be a gauge symmetry because GR does very well. If I start tinkering with GR by adding R square terms, I get into trouble with the quantum gravity. Better to have a fifth force which starts dominating at low accelerations, and then it's a gauge symmetry and. Uh, we need to look for its photons. I mean, the, the, I, I would go for that, you know. I don't know. <laughs> okay. I, I, I'm open on that point. On that yeah. Side. Yeah, when, when you say that uh, white binaries doesn't rule out dark matter elsewhere, but it makes things uh, very tricky. Like if you want dark matter on CMB scales, but not on dialectic scales because white binaries rule that out. Then what happened to that dark matter when structure was forming? I think we run into a lot of difficulties. Uh, anyway, it's okay. Uh, thanks, Tim, for engaging with us on these alternative ideas. Uh, let's see, uh, there's a remark. Uh, uh, Bernd is asking Claudio, what kind of fermions are proposed uh, so that the cast problem goes away. And uh, Claudio, are you on uh, audio? Can you respond to that? Uh, right-handed neutrinos. Uh, yeah, that's what, oh, Claudio can't talk, but it's a right-handed neutrinos. Okay, and the historical remark by Bernd, uh, would supergravity be an example of modified gravity and dark matter? One modified the Einstein protection by adding fermionic gravity. I don't know, Tim, you have you can say supergravity as well. Yeah, so supergravity um, does add gravitinos, and so it adds the dark matter components in that form. It it doesn't really result in the chain the kind of modified modification to gravity that uh, is is needed by Mond naively. Maybe there are some formulations of it, but they they're not minimal ones. The minimal supergravity extensions they don't have anything Mond like in them. Yeah, yeah. I also sometimes maybe in a light humor I ask my dark matter friends suppose. Newton had come around and he saw these flat rotation curves at the same time. So both Kepler and Vera Rubin show up at Newton's place that, oh, you know, I have this T squared by R cube and Vera Rubin says I have these flat rotation curves. What would Newton do? I mean, <laughs> would he say that, okay, some dark matter here, some law of gravitation here, or would he go about fitting uh, a new law of gravitation everywhere, you know, just for fun, I mean. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, David, go ahead, please. All right. Yeah, thanks, Titinda. I'm sorry if this is too much of um, a digression of um, topic, but I'm curious, the other big clue as to what's going on in the, in the dark sector is perhaps something from dark energy, the apparent cosmic acceleration. I'm wondering in the dark matter community whether that's just kind of, taken to be a very difficult technical theoretical problem to do with vacuum energy for, for theorists to worry about or whether it's also taken into consideration in terms of understanding dark matter in a kind of more general unified dark sector or something like that. Yeah, I mean, I think both to some <laughs> extent are true. Uh, it's not a huge community that works on dark energy because it is, a like you said, a difficult problem depending how you want to look at it. Um, that said, there are people who look at couplings between dark energy and dark matter and, and how to cosmologically constrain those. 
the fact that we now have mysteries like the Hubble tension and most recently the Davy measurements uh, suggesting that the acceleration of the universe, you know, that the dark energy does not have a, you know, um, a constant um, equation of motion. Those are suggesting that maybe there's something dynamical there. And, you know, and there is, um, there's a whole family of theories called quintessence that basically try to make the dark energy dynamical. So it is something that is actively being worked on, though, to a lesser degree, I would say. But I think the fraction of people working on it is probably growing with time. It's a very interesting, you know, laboratory to play with. So, okay, if I can ask more generally, if you wanted to make some, if you wanted to make some kind of tweaks to cold dark matter to make it fit better, I mean, what kind of thing would work better? Kind of self interacting dark matter, interacting with dark energy a bit. What what kind of things would kind of help? If, if, yeah, if I don't, help I don't think there's a very, I don't think there's a very clear indication so far. Coupling dark matter to dark energy usually has resulted in constraints. So mm -hmm. it doesn't seem to particularly improve things, though, you know, like I said, there are a bunch of sort of mysteries that have appeared in cosmological data just in the last, you know, five years or so. And I'm not really up to date on whether maybe some of those could be addressed, especially the, the Daisy one is, is really just brand new. Um, so I, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Ashutosh, could I ask you for your take? You have heard the white binary talks. You heard Tim today, and of course you are into this for a long time. But what is your current thinking? There are gravitational anomalies. What are we supposed to do now? What are we supposed to do? Well, my probably uninformed gut feeling is if if you're debating dark matter hypotheses. It seems to me that dark energy is an even weaker footing than dark matter somehow. So that 70%, which is called dark energy, may have more mundane explanations than dark matter. I agree that is even much less understood but uh, suppose we do not go that far. Okay. The, the dark matter problem has been around now, let's say at least from the time of Vera Rubin, that's probably half a century or close to. Uh, so oh. where, why, why, why are we having such a difficult time sorting uh, sorting this out? So two, two comments there. A within the standard model which took more than 100 years to figure out the range you know we have fermions and bosons and we have different fermions participating in different gauge interactions like tim said there are quarks which bridge them all but then there are charged leptons and neutrinos which gets so if you follow that trend what he was saying there's no reason for the spectrum of fermion shall we say to stop at these three gauge groups. Why not have SUXN, as he was saying, which is decoupled from any of these. And so there could be fermions that only have that SUN and don't have any of the so standard model gauge interactions. Why not? The, the, nothing in the standard model suggests that there should be some bridging fermion that has every possible gauge interaction that is out there. In that yeah. sense, no astronomy, astrophysics, cosmology needed, just a field theorist, you know, representation theorist, one of you can say, no reason for the standard model to stop. It didn't stop long ago, and why should it stop now? So therefore, dark matter is a natural extension of every matter thing we know. You don't need cosmology or, or Vera Rubin or anybody else to say this is the end of the matter content. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now you come along with Vera Rubin or whatever and say, oh, then maybe that's what it is. So that's that's, mm -hmm. that's one thing. One thing uh, what the, it's other, the other that... reason is such a long time to figure out is the usual problem of experimental data getting sparser and sparser. The lower the interaction, the harder it is to get data. And so harder it is to get data. Why are we studying neutrinos after 
70 years of neutrino discovery, right? So the weaker the interaction, the harder to get data. The harder it is to take data, the more we fumble around in the dark. Mm -hmm. No pun intended. Yeah. yeah. Well, one uh, response to that could be that the fact that the Higgs scale is so much smaller than the Planck scale is a very important piece of information. Maybe, maybe there was an inflation which ended at the electroweak scale and brought the quantum gravity scale all the way down from the Planck scale to the Higgs scale, which might be one reason that uh, the standard model is all that is there to it. Uh, because uh, that this is also the quantum gravity scale. Because some people say that, how come the standard model has been standard for quite a few decades now? Is that itself a hint that uh, despite our appearances or decide, despite beliefs, the electroweak scale is a very fundamental scale beyond which uh, there is a desert? Yes. Tim, do you think that way? Some. Uh... Um, I'm very much a bottom-up theorist. I mean, I, I believe that the electric hierarchy is a very interesting question. I've actually worked on it a lot in the past, but um, I'm really driven by observation and data. So uh, I think it's an interesting idea uh, and it would be interesting to build models and see actually what they tell you. I, I actually think that's a worthwhile thing to do, uh, but I don't know that much about it myself. I'm sorry to say. So, so Tejinder and everybody here, the complex, if I say it right, the complexified octonionic ideas, I remember a little bit from last year. Do, does there, is there dark matter candidates in there? Yeah, okay, since you asked, that is where my bias comes. There is a fifth force, uh, at least in my work, which is uh, whose gauge, it's a U1 gauge symmetry, which is the dark analog of uh, electrodynamics, so I called it dark electromagnetism. It seems to have Mond-like properties, which we are trying to investigate uh, whether it will work well on CMB scales. Um, so, uh, we are still at very early stages, so that's where I like the idea that its gauge boson is my dark matter. I should look for it in the lab. But it's a different kind of dark matter. Why does my dark matter have to be particulate in the fermionic massive sense? It has to be a new particle that uh, can we can be sure about. There, but there is no dark matter candidate. There are st right-handed sterile neutrinos, but there is no reason why their mass should be very different from that of the ordinary neutrino. Sterile neutrinos will be will definitely be there. They are predicted. So I, they should be found one day. They definitely should be sterile neutrinos. Maybe they are a small dark matter component, but it is not clear that they can be all the dark matter. I see. So, 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 so what you and there is sorry, there, there's something the very special about the standard model. The SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 comes very naturally in some way from E8. It is favored over SUNs with the higher end, you know. Each of the E8 groups in E8 cross E8 branches into four <laughs> SU3s. And this is required by if we believe in division algebras. If we say that my fundamental Lie algebras are to be constructed from division algebras like quaternions and octonions, then this SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 is favored. It is mathematically favored on theoretical grounds. And on the other hand, if we come from the guts approach, you know, there are so many possibilities as SO10 and others. But those don't arise here at all in this picture. What arises is a U1 dark electromagnetism and another SU3, which is like 
maybe like dark QCD in some sense, but I, I don't understand that. So is that what you are asking, Ashutosh? I see. So you got it. So you're saying the sterile neutrinos can't be all the dark matter in your model, but mixing in the dark U1, which sort of appears to modify gravity in a sense, mm -hmm. that combined with sterile neutrinos together might offer the... Yes, yeah. you, you could say that, yes. It would help and the bullet cluster kind of uh, scale cluster scales, bullets cluster. It's good to have live sterile neutrinos. That is uh, true. So as I said, so the th kind of thing that struck me was this fundamental acceleration scale, which if the observers are correct, seems to me a very strong signature, which I, in my opinion, dark matter would have difficulty explaining where is this acceleration scale coming from? Maybe Tim, you want to say something on this? Um... No, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, okay, I think others should also speak. I've been doing a lot of talking. Michael, you want to say something? Um. Well, only just to say, well, first of all, thank Tim for an absolutely fascinating exposition. I I, I learned an enormous amount. Um. Also, just to say, if it, it's not to, you know, to state the blinding lobbies, of course, there are other theoretical scenarios Um. Uh, over and above, uh, you know, quintessence and your own, you know, sort of octonionic flavored um, approach to extensions of the standard model, which would deliver Mond type, um, or, or which which would suggest might might cover, you know, re recover the Mond type phenomenology. Um, and I have in mind sort of Igor's uh, pre-canonical quantization approach, uh, which where, where again you have a derivation of the acceleration field in. In mm -hmm. that, so I mean, there is, you know, the at that level, clearly, you know, things are wide open. Um, but um, but but in in terms of the 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 way that the the current phenomenology and the uh, uh, constraints uh, this sector, I'd I'd like to understand more. Could could Tim? I'm very sorry. I'm I'm afraid I'm ignorant. But could could you say a little bit more about this Davy anomaly that's recently been? Um, that's, Daisy. Uh, oh, uh, Daisy. Oh, Daisy. Sorry, I was mishearing it. Daisy, yes. Uh, is it, I'm, I'm probably everybody here knows about this, so I'm sorry to ask a, a question from the point of view of an absolute ignoramus in the field. Is, is it possible just to say very briefly what that is about? Sure. I mean, I, I'm not an expert on this, but um, so what Daisy is doing is looking at the distribution of structures of, of matter um, throughout basically the recent history of the universe, and this gives you good constraints on the evolution of the universe. Um, right. And so their best fit uh, is, so what they're really trying to study is um, more dark energy actually than dark matter. But um, right. so what they're studying, the way they parameterize the dark energy is um, based on an equation of state. So the equation of state right, tells how its pressure is related to its energy. And then also, you know, you can imagine that this equation of state evolves with time. Um, this this can happen easily for for different things in quantum field theory, um, and so they parameterize also how much it's changing in recent times as like the derivative of 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 the equation of state parameter. Okay. So what they find is that their data, especially in com combination with various other big cosmological surveys, shows a preference for, I mean, a significant preference for an equation of state which is uh, changing noticeably over time. Hmm. Which would suggest a dynamical origin of the, the dynamical dark, system. Absolutely, that's dynamical right. system for the dark matter, as as you speculated. Yeah. So so um, oh sorry for the dark energy, I should say. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so in fact, it might be. Uh, I, I was quite intrigued by what Ashutosh's um, passing remark that perhaps the explanation of dark energy would turn out to be more mundane than expected it might of course also turn out to be even more arcane <laughs> yes that's right <laughs> yeah yeah they're very interesting stuff indeed um by the way did you know and i i absolutely agree i think it would be very good if we could get a talk uh sometime in in one of our um remaining slots by a 
galaxy formation specialist. Um, my friend, I'm, I'm, I'm James Binney in Oxford is 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 an old acquaintance of mine, very old. I mean, we go back together to school days, literally. And um, I'm I'm sure that uh, one of his pupils would probably be very interested in 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 perhaps giving a talk. So perhaps we could pencil yeah. that in as a possibility. Hmm. So related to what you said just now, Tim, if it's a uh, varying equation of state for dark energy, does that impact in any way our understanding on the nature of dark matter, or these are decoupled? Um, they could possibly be coupled, but I think uh, there hasn't been a lot of investigation with that. So um, I think right now it doesn't clearly impact our understanding, but that's not to say that it, it's not possible that it would if we could just, you know, investigate more. It, it's one of those situations where it's not really what you expected to see. And so people are not, they have not been working on this for a long time, right? That now many people are trying to jump in and see what they can say about it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree, Michael. We should have a talk on galaxy formation and the role of dark matter yes yes i've, I've thought that for a little while so i'm glad to, glad to hear that being echoed right so it's nearly time many more questions so thanks so much tim it was very very informative and up to date yes. uh, thank you very much yeah. thank you i appreciated the discussion yeah, can I echo that also, Tim? Thank you. It, was, it really was a, a, a beautifully organized talk, and I, I learned a very great deal from it. Thanks. Okay, great. Uh, should we wind up? Any more questions, please? So we'll see you uh, two weeks from now on May 24th, and uh, that would be Leron Bo Boston on Gravity as the Square of Young Mills Theory. And a few weeks on the line, Burnt, you are talking in June. How are you feeling nowadays, Burnt? You're doing fine? Yes, I've recovered from my flu uh, attack. Oh, so I, I had the flu for, for a few weeks and now I'm better. And I hope it will not come back in the middle of June so I can give my talk. So sorry for not being able to give the talk two uh, weeks That's earlier. No but I... Can't see, uh, I hope I'm good to know you feel fine. So June 14th right. is your talk, I think, the... There's probably one between your talk and Leron's talk, I think. Siddhant. Siddhant is before you, I think. The time the Siddhant of... is on the 7th, I think, isn't he? On the 7th, June, yeah. and then Burnt is after that. Yeah, yes, right. Looking uh, forward to your talk very much, Burnt. I'm glad you're feeling better. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much, also, to Professor Tate, for the nice talk and yeah. informative, yeah. comprehensive, uh, very thank extensive you. talk on dog matter. <laughs> So maybe Tim, you all will organize a conference with the Mon guys and the Dark Matter guys are all together. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> I'll try. Yeah, it's not very popular in the U.S., is it? The Mon. Um, I mean, there are some people who are very excited about it here, but yes, it's not. Yeah, it's not very popular. I think it's, it's less popular both in the U.S. and in Europe than, than say, dark matter is. It is in the U.S. Just Stacey Mankoff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe this is a dumb idea, but there seems to be a huge kind of rift between the dark matter theorists and the uh, modified gravity people. Is there any idea of engaging philosophers or... Psychologists of science. Uh, I know this <laughs> sounds strange. Uh, I don't mean this in a mean way. I don't want. No, to no, no, but if I can say very quickly, but there's actually a, a kind of. Right. I guess you would need a communication expert or a communication scientist there's... to somehow manage to bridge the gap between the two camps or something like this. Yes, yeah, there's right. actually a conference. Sorry, if I can say quickly that to, to to that point, then there's actually a conference coming up in. Um... Uh, the next month in June in Italy in Urbino, it's this year's um, Philosophy of Physics Summer School, organized by the Italian Society for Philosophy for the Philosophy of Science S R S I L F S, which is precisely on the topic of um, of of philosophy philosophical so philosophical and methodological issues around dark uh, around um, dark matter. And Eric Curiel, in fact, is one of the keynote speakers. We, oh, okay. we will be recording it for, for the archive. 
Um, so watch this space. Um, so, so yeah, the answer maybe... to your question is yes, and I, I expect that to be an extremely interesting meeting, partly because yes. you know the, I know the people involved, and some of them are are, are very smart. <laughs> I'm remembering the you know the century old debate, the Shaplik put his debate of whether the so called nebulae are in our uh, sea or whether they are, but at least they had a debate. They were talking to each other. That that uh, we need a debate and we need some kind of mediator. Somebody who's neutral but also accepted by both sides so that they come together because at the moment there's uh, too much. Well, they talk about each other but not with, with each other. That's uh, I think that's the problem. And uh, somehow, yeah, tense front lines between both approaches and this, with a few exceptions. Uh, for example, Pavel yes. Cooper and Bonn uses sterile neutrinos in his model. So he, uh, but yeah, in most cases, this, this is kind of strange, so there's no real debate. I mean, in the end, both of you could be right. So uh, and, and this is something which should be rela relaxing to both sides. It's not that you necessarily lose something. You just have to accept that the other side might be right to some extent as well. And, but it's not that uh, if you look at the data, I would say it's not, it's most likely that we have some kind of modified gravity and dark matter. So. You don't have to choose one side at the moment if you look at the, at the data. You have to combine both sides. So, yeah. Yes, dare I say, it sounds like very you know, the idea of a Hegelian synthesis. Um, well, I won't go there. Um, but, yes, yeah. but of course, we have been in such positions in the history of, well, obviously in the history of science in general, but in cosmology in particular before. I mean, when thinks of the way that the, the terms of the debate between the steady state people and the, the Big Bang people it, it, played it, it, out over the decades, it... Um, it, it, it was. I mean, it became very confrontational, certainly at one. Um, and then, while it, at one point, it appeared it was simply settled down and over. But you could say that, in a methodologically quite uh, you know, radically altered way, that something like you know, Big Bang scenarios through, for instance, um, you know, um, it, um, Lindy's inflation. In, yeah, in a have, sense, have uh, come back in 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 in, in, in slightly in, yes, 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 you know, in, in a disguised or altered form. So it, you know, when when debates are, as it were, are conceptually um, as profound as that, the, the, the sometimes the terms of the debate alter, but the debate itself, of course, recurs. In it, it's, it's like the like the, the the match constantly has to be played over, you know, on, on a different ground. Actually, if you look at uh, in eternal inflation, that's, uh, you're right. It's a blend of the old steady state with the Big Bang model. Yes, you, one could one can certainly look at it in that way. So yeah. you could look at it only that yeah. you have uh, you have a global universe which is in the uh, your, well you have a multiverse which is in a steady state, but your patch of the multiverse, your your, your local universe, is an evolutionary universe. But overall, you still you have you're back to the steady state idea actually. So, but the yeah. the, the, the kind of conceptually the take home message of this is that. Um, the, you know the, this very kind of confrontational viewpoint, which just says, you know, under which flag Bexonian uh, speak or die, to quote Shakespeare, is is rarely is rarely a good way of trying to conduct scientific discussion. Yeah, yeah I think that there are <laughs> clear cut once and for all victors. You know, we yeah, that, that's then the experiment will decide. Just like and... the mind. Yeah. If if a dark matter particle is discovered tomorrow in the laboratory, that'll be the end of the debate. I think. Yes, that's true, of course, as well. And I, I do very much. I don't it. know whether this will empty debate. Sorry to interrupt, but uh, we have so many. Uh, we have a lot of data which are, which can also be fitted by modified gravity, and we have these relations. I don't think that that uh, one particle detection alone will settle the debate. Okay. The only thing we... but I think we are holding Tim for too long. I'm sorry, oh, yeah, we sorry. probably yeah, are, Tim. Yeah, you probably yeah. want to get, get yeah, away. Hours, so... Sorry, to <laughs> Professor Tate. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Thank and you. Continue uh, the discussion I am actually going to bow out, however, as much as this is an interesting discussion. But uh, no, sure. thank you. I've enjoyed well, once it again, much. Tim. Thank you very much indeed for terrific. Okay, talk. Thank you, and bye bye, everybody. I'm leaving. Okay. Logging out. Well, do you want to stay on just for a couple of minutes, agenda, to continue the discussion with Bert, Brent, or or, or you know, shall we leave that to another time? Gone already. So he's oh, he's already gone. Okay. Question I'm, quite happy. I'm quite out. happy for us to continue for a minute or two if, if, if Ashutosh and the others want to stay just for a moment, because I think this is quite an interesting uh, an interesting point. No, I agree with you. I mean, very, very rarely is there a single once and for all uh, you know, closure of a debate, particularly one which is involves 
really the the tension between two profoundly different conceptual frameworks and mathematical research programs uh, that's just resolved by a single observation. On the other hand, I also completely agree with Ashutosh that the fact that as one gets to weaker and weaker interactions, data becomes thinner and thinner and more and more difficult to to know to 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 detect uh, does enormously. Uh, well, it, it it means obviously that the theoretic the theory space is so is so unconstrained by comparison with other areas that uh, um, you know that that has a transformative effect, and it obviously means that you know it, it, a great deal of time is wasted in in what in retrospect just turns out to have been empty speculation, um, which is not where, where you have obviously much more much richer data. I don't know if Ashutosh would agree with that, but. Broadly. That's exactly what is happening. I mean, bottom line, the experimentalists aren't getting smarter at the rate <laughs> that we need to. <laughs> well, I don't think that's for want of trying on their part. I really. I know. I'm one of them. So unfortunately, we are we are we we are creatures on the scale of which we are constructed, and it's it does become there are certain you know limitations. I I think it's remarkable, really. It is when you think how. Uh, I was I was just hearing the other day that, uh, for instance, in LIGO, the detection, what was it that um, they can now discriminate? There was some there was some um, measurement that was recently conducted in LIGO, which I I was I was hearing from one of the people involved. It, it literally um, the, the, the quantity that is being detected is 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 literally at the ratio of the width of the human hair to that of the distance from here to the you know to the nearest uh, to the nearest star uh i mean as a rate i mean you know you're you're dealing with those kind of uh tolerances so it's 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 absolutely astonishing how far the you know the obs observational physics has come and when you consider that I, i'm old enough to remember when observational cosmology was regarded as almost a contradiction in terms people said you know what are you talking about it's you know it's that's that's why cosmology will never be a proper science it's all theology you know they'll know um <laughs> you know, it's you know I'm, I'm, no I'm, I'm sure there are plenty of people perhaps not in this audience but i'm certainly old enough to remember when cosmologists were regularly told you don't belong in a physics department you belong in a theology department um where it, well well today i i think one could argue that with ligo and whether that cosmology is perhaps well i wouldn't say the the best observationally underpinned sector in the whole of physics but it's certainly as observationally well underpinned in many areas um, in terms of the precision of measurements as, as any area in physics and that's a transformation which we've seen in in the space of no more than 40 years so mm -hmm. i wouldn't be too pessimistic about um, the future it may well be that the the observation uh, the observation will constrain the theory space in these areas that at the moment, as, as you say, we particularly in low-end well, phenomena, it seems to be very, very difficult. Need to see not how further it constraints, on the, but something new. <laughs> I mean, what have been, we, we have been constraining theories for the last decades. Constraining theories would be the option we are perfect at the moment. So we are endlessly constraining uh, theories, but at some point we should find out something new. At not well, I'm not quite sure what you mean by, by that. I mean, uh, the I mean, new theoretical scenarios are being proposed all the time, and some of them coming from what seem to be conceptually, mathematically very, very powerful and very deep yes, sources. But, 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 I mean, but I mean, that's uh, not what you have in mind. But in terms of which is then validated by experiment. This well, yes, to... I, I, I see. Okay, I'm, 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 I was hoping that was what you were going to say. Yes, Discovery yes, yes. new means precisely that the observational constraints become good enough for us to simply, you know select is to, you know, to say no this class of theories is now effectively ruled out i assume that's what ashtosh had in mind yeah but at the moment we're only effectively ruling out everything which is not already written in the textbooks uh, this is very harsh ah uh, well okay yes i mean yes of course it's possible there's some completely radically rev revisionary new framework um yeah but Yes, I don't okay. know. I wouldn't argue with that. I mean, but, but the, something the, the, new. It just means something which is not, which is, I mean, does is not follow from the standard in... models. That's what I want to oh, say. Oh, sure. And this is why I'm interested in the approaches people like Basil Hiley and people like uh, like Igor and, you know, his pursuit of the pre-canonical quantization program. These are very, very bold, very speculative suggestions which really go right outside 
um, certainly the the well they go they go right outside the theory space, but they go to regions of the theory space a long, long way removed from the you know, the things which are regarded as mainstream. And, and I certainly think it's worth very worthwhile encouraging people to work on those. But um, yeah, for sure, but I still right. think I still think that it is through. At the end of the day, I mean, if physics becomes detached from observation, um, it's I, I'm sorry, this is this is a statement of the blindingly obvious, I know. But, you know, the more that physics becomes detached from from observation, you know, the more likely it is that it's going to lose its way and you know, run into the sand. I agree, See, I agree as well. So, so, so I'm not again. Sorry, don't no. misunderstand me. The, the problem we have at the moment is that all of our observations always, or well, well, yes, in most cases, confirm what we already know. That's the problem. We would need an observation with well, some kind of new idea. It doesn't have a wild new idea. Yes. That's what I mean. And uh, yeah, I understand the point. But although I'm extremely curious, given that. Okay, and we all know that observation is itself theory laden. I mean, I'm sorry, I don't want to sound like a first year, you know, undergraduate philosopher of science, um, but but um, um, but 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 yes, I mean, all all of that, I I, I take for granted. Uh, it would be very surprising uh, if um, it, if ob observation didn't confirm our or confirm, not refute <laughs> our existing theories most of the time. Otherwise, we would uh, you know suddenly find ourselves back in a. You know, in in a world of almost total ignorance. I mean, clearly, um, at least as effective yes. theories, uh, you know, the theories we have. Yes, 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 yes. For, for most of the at the moment, we have the opposite problem. You're right. If we constantly <laughs> refute our theories, this would also be a problem. But at the moment, we have uh, the problem on the opposite scale. We, yeah. we don't find anything new at all. Yes, I I agree, and I think that's partly because we've got so good at you know what testing the existing theories and, and obviously as Ashutosh points out um you you've got the problem of the of the desert um I mean even the assumption that there will necessarily be new physics at the Planck length I think is already um, quite a big assumption I mean, there are all sorts of reasons why one should anticipate that but they seem to rest rest partly on assumptions about the character of physical and dimensions than quantities that I mean it's quite interesting when when Planck originally proposed the or identified the Planck length as a fundamental scale back at the beginning of the 20th century um it was in the context of a discussion about you know, about dimensionless units um it wasn't in it was only much later that people uh, kind of su suggested that this would be a this would be the scale at which new physics would appear because it would yes, be which our a, notion of a localized entity would break down altogether and um, our, you know continue any kind of continuous space-time geometry would break down and that came up much later and and it's certainly not self-evident that quantum gravity whatever that turns out to be or even you know as Roger Penrose is constantly reminding us the you know, the the gravita the gravita the gravitization of the quantum which is you know, the way he prefers to to say that we should be thinking about things, um, will actually manifest in terms of phenomenology, uh, will necessarily have to wait until we get to the Planck scale. The, the phenomenology might show up many orders of magnitude above that. I hope you're right. Yeah. Well, there are suggestions that there are, you know, things and understand people working on things like the surface of Newton. Um, what is it, surface tension of neutron stars and things like that, who suggest that there should be signatures of quantum gravity phenomenology you know, at that scale that might even be very close to, you know, very, very close to the frontier of observational detection even now. So we'll see. It's a very exciting time. I and hope it will become... Sorry, sorry Ashutosh. Did you mean... On the neutron stars, did you mean the ring down of neutron star mergers could be different? That's a suggestion which I've heard. Yes, that's the suggestion. Got it. Okay. I yes, know yes. I'm sorry, I was expressing it very, very badly. And uh, also, there are these things called um, so-called Planck stars, which uh, Ravelli has been writing about recently. Um, I, I mean, I'll, I'll send you the references to the to the to the papers that I had in mind. But um, this is all, as I say, way beyond my pay grade. So I. Just, um, but but certainly the general suggestion that that there might be um, 
quantum gravity, I'm using the term loosely for whatever new physics lies at or beyond the Planck length, um, or Planck scale more generally, um, although there does seem to be something quite distinct about the Planck length as against the Planck mass or other, but at any rate, at the, the Planck scale, um, that might show up considerably sooner, I mean, in terms of you know, distances or energy scales. Um, in other words, that the, 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 that the desert, the, no, that the, the the desert might not actually be, you know, a completely featureless desert all the way from from the from the standard the scale of the standard model down to the Planck length. That there might be things, particularly in astrophysics, that might might uh, show up in between, that might give a clue as to, to new physics. Um, I know this is very hand wavy speculation, but. Obviously, that's what I think you know, we hope for. I have an idea. Let's make a bet. Because you're so optimistic and I'm natural born pessimist. <laughs> Let's say we bet that in uh, the next 10 years, we will discover any hint of quantum gravity. So you bet for it and I bet against it. Uh, I'm not sure. That, okay. Well, I, I, I would just like to think I'm still going to be around in 10 years time to, to, to either to collect on the bet or to pay it. But on the assumption that I will, which is, you know, I'm being optimistic, um, then yes, I think I would make a small bet, maybe a a, a bottle of champagne. Okay. Uh, but we'll, we'll we'll but we'll have to agree before before we we absolutely you know confirm the bet. We'll have to degree, agree on what we would count as evidence for the quantum gra from from quantum gravity. Okay, so I will be quite liberal. So, like for example, if somebody shows that there's a gravitational mediated entanglement, this would act. This would also uh, fulfill the bet. And any uh, if or if something. Okay, uh, no. If you that that that's a very good. In fact, that would actually be one of my. That would be one of my suggestions as as to where we should be looking for the signature, and that is something which I think we might just might certainly conceivably um turn up uh, evidence of within the next decade so yeah okay I, i'll 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 give you the bet <laughs> okay you can choose the uh, champagne um, wonderful but, uh, but listen, course, do other people it... do other people i i i've been burbling nonsense uh ashitosh no, you know, do you say anything or shall we bring the call to an end okay more leave something for the next time yes by sure okay yes. i'm sorry we're going off into the philosophical weeds after such a very very you know, contentful and precise talk by Tim about the astrophysics. Okay, look forward very much to seeing you all in uh, two weeks' time. Thank yeah, you again, and everybody. thank you for the nice uh, discussion great. afterwards. That's great, very and for nice. accepting my bet. <laughs> oh yes, that's all right. And look, looking forward to your talk very much in three weeks as well. Thank all you. The best. Take care. Bye. Bye.